If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Pedros. Coolian. Wow. Or is it Quailian? You could do the movie. You could do the movie guy. One man. Yes. Takes on the world. One, oh, one man. The world of trainers. Three, three children. Trainers who don't know shit about business. <laughs> One man is there for them. My voice is almost like that. It's Bedros. Because I have a cold. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Can you do anything like, can you do any voices, Adam, or are you stuck with your... No, I'm stuck with... Anything anything outside of that is... Squeaks. Yeah, you can do... (laughs) Yeah, it goes... It goes different. Gotta stick with me. That's that's, all I got. You know, it's a trade-off. It is a trade-off. You're like... I'm really... Distinctively your voice, I'm really good at me. Yeah. Really good. Yeah, you know, but you know what I'm saying? It's very polished. Like, I feel like like you had a you had a magic genie at some point, and he's like, give me, grant me a wish, and you're like, uh, and he's like, okay, whatever you want, you go, I want the best radio voice of all time and he grants it to you but there's a twist right you, you can't, can't do anybody do, that's else. all you have limited <laughs> that you can't purely limited you can't like yell across the room at your girl you can't, can't call sing. anybody yeah, yeah. like I mean, anytime you push you it can it just do turns the off. shit out of that radio voice do you think do you think a lot of those guys like i think of um bruce buffer Right, like, does he uh, talk yeah. like that in real real life? You I imagine mean, if he did, yeah, <laughs> it, like as he's having sex. All <laughs> right, we're here today. <laughs> Let's get ready to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I always said he had the best job. Like, all he does is he gets up and fucking talks for yeah, dude. One you know, minute. do you know a couple of his his one liners? Trademarked that. Oh, he's trademarked him, and he makes you have a to pay f- money, fuck ton of money, just to say that stuff. Yeah, God. Trademark that That's saying. Brilliant. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, so you can't say let's get like, ready to run. Like, we're put, probably. Yeah. I've been trying to push Doug to, to get the motherfucking qua. Like I want to get that before it's too oh, late. Wow. That's ours. Yeah. I don't think anyone's gonna want to steal that. <laughs> <laughs> Not <laughs> right. That. You yeah. say that right now, but I bet yeah. you that Bruce Buffer didn't didn't. Or I mean, obviously he realized it early on. I mean, when he actually went out and thought about trademarking it, but yeah. I'm sure the first time he said it, he didn't go like, "Oh my God, everybody around the world is say man, this." It's so funny. Right. You know what's going to be? You, you know what's funny about this this episode? People are about to listen to is uh, one of the most common messages that I know I get, and I know you guys get too, is from trainers who really appreciate when we talk about like how to build their business as personal trainers because you get nothing. Oh, no, you get no yeah. training there no, at all. No certification provides like any valuable business information no, and, to and go along with it. Arguably, that's the most important part. Yeah, yeah that, that's what's I mean? going to keep the lights on. Yeah, because like the whole reason why you're a trainer in the first place is because you want to be a good trainer. So you're, so you're automatically going to hopefully learn how to be a good trainer. The other part isn't so obvious, which is you, to be a good trainer, you need to know how to like run a business and sell yourself and market and all that shit and you get zero training it's like they throw you to the sharks it's seriously appalling yeah how you know you're you started with adam so you had somebody show you and then adam when you started mm-hmm. you were just talking to people yeah no i was I was, like, I was i was a lost puppy dog for sure when i first started i remember the first day of work the the boss came in and he and he handed me this stack of oh you had the the, the shit leads the stack of papers <laughs> then one of the glen gary leads bro yeah. it was like from three they're like three four years old Cold logs for days just all these yeah. people that i came in and done a free fitness assessment when they bought their membership and then never either came back to the gym i'm forever or- grateful for that though because that's how i met my wife right <laughs> yeah. you cold called yeah. her i cold called her yeah, right for real did you really yeah and she just yeah, she was just down. She was she was in some store like Burlington Coat Factory. I remember this vividly. Really? And yeah. did, 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 did and you? I, had, I got her into the gym. Now, when she walked in, and you're a trainer. Yeah. Uh, did you? Were you like? Oh. It was like gold mine. You were like, oh, yeah. this is gonna work. Yeah, I was like, this, I'm gonna make this one happen. You knew right away. Yeah. I'm like, did I'm, you? I'm gonna close this. Did she end up hiring you, or did you just train her for free because you liked her? No. I, <laughs> Boy, sucker, I got more sucker. skills than that. Come on. <laughs> Come on, she paid. She actually hired you? Hell yeah. She gave you money to-, to- the, Yeah, this was after, because those sessions, they have to burn through those sessions. Oh, right, right. Yeah, right. so they had like, she had like five sessions. Do you know my- Sold her a 20 my, pack. My, my furthest memory back of Courtney is she used to come in and train with Justin, and she used to wear this shirt that said, nurses do it with patients. Right. <laughs> It's my favorite shirt, dude. Yeah. I used to love yeah. that shirt. I remember she, that. She was a nurse, for those that don't know that, so I, that's what made it really fucking funny. It was funny. a funny was, shirt. Yeah. Did, did she like yeah. you right away, or was she, kind of, was, she, was she like, did you have to work no, it? No, no. She didn't like me at all. For reals? Well, I mean, she liked me. She just didn't really find me attractive. Really? Uh, yeah, because she was with somebody. Oh, shit. Yeah. 
Did, oh, she, I didn't know did that she cheat on her boyfriend with you, or did she break up with him first? Um, Ooh, that's a good question. I think we know the answer. It's a good question. <laughs> the, the timing, I don't know how that syncs up. <laughs> I definitely know who the winner was. In that oh, one. Yeah. <laughs> you were that guy? Uh, I didn't dude, know that. How I, was, many, I was aggressive. You know what's? You know how many people like get jealous of their girlfriends or whatever training with trainers? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's some truth to that for oh, sure. Of course. There oh, is. do you remember when I I posted like two years ago? Some crazy. I, I remember reading an article on some stats on that. I think. Uh, God, it was like 70 something percent of trainers like sleep yeah. with their clients and shit. It's a fucking crazy stat, dude. I know, it's terrible. It's deep on my Instagram, somewhere way back there. I, it's I, actually a terrible, it's one of the top it's five a bad, or it's ten. A bad stigma. It is. And I think it's just because it's so. Do you know what's another one that's personal? really bad? Hmm. Uh, Hospitals. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, so you guys were just a fucking. You guys are made for each other. Yeah, exactly. you guys are just, we're just fucking. Yeah. <laughs> Scandalous. <Just> do you, <laughs> we're like uh, we're like desperate half like, uh, like Do you guys ever uh, do you guys ever role play? Like do you do you ever play like trainer, <laughs> nurse, and, yeah, nurse trainer, trainer client or nurse and my patient? favorite is in the gym. Yeah, you know I mean when you train her? Yeah, well just like pretending, you know. <laughs> Just doing some Ben O'Rose or something. This is getting weird. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. Yeah. She's like, every time you train me, Justin, you make yeah. me do glute exercises. I can never do anything yeah. else. We've never done the, oh, I'm a patient. I'm there's something, <laughs> there's yeah. something to be said, though, no, about the, the importance of of doing those things. And I, you know, and I know a lot of trainers. It always told me a, a lot about the trainer's character when I would drop that book on him and be like, listen, let's. this is where you start. You start here. Yep. You start yep. getting... Because it is, but that, it, it, and it does kind of weed out the the weak ones, the weak ones. Yeah. But at the same time, totally. it also highlights the terrible training. Because how many trainers could become, you know, risk, relatively successful if they just got right. the right training? Right. Yeah, you know what I mean. How many Absolutely. people do we lose? Like when I first became a trainer, which is which was a while ago, right? it was over twenty years ago. I walked into the gym, got hired, and I'm 18 years old, so I'm a young kid. And the top trainer, this is what they did. He said, okay, follow this guy around on his Fit Start appointments. You guys remember Fit Starts, right? These are like orientations for new members, which really the goal is to get them to buy training. So I followed the top trainer who, let's see, it was, I think it was like the middle of the month. So like the 13th or 14th of the month. And he'd already sold, I think, like $1,400 or $1,500 in personal training, which back then was a lot of money. We're talking the, you know, 97. So this is 1997. Back in those days, if you sold, you know, two to three grand in personal training in a month, you were like king, right? And he was. He was like one of the top guys. He'd already had sold like $1,400. So he's like, he thinks he's like the shit, right? And I'm this mm -hmm. young kid, like an idiot. That's in his mind. So I follow him along. He doesn't really pay much attention to me. You know, just follow me and don't talk. And I did for a couple of his fit starts. And then this lazy fucker's like, hey, listen, you want, you're just, I'm just going to have you take the, my next three. Because back in those days... They didn't view these appointments as anything other than just you have to do them. Yeah. Uh, now, I later learned, like, this is where you get your clients, you moron. Like, getting leads is one of the hardest things. Right. And you only get paid minimum wage to do them. But if so they you hire you, if they hire you, then you get paid much more. I think the I think you got, like, 20-something dollars an hour, which is a good amount of money for an 18-year-old kid, especially, you know, 18-year-old, uh, you know, in, in fitness. That's a decent amount of money back then. So he leaves, and he gives me three appointments. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you can take them and don't worry about it. So I, when he left, before he left, I said, so is this how we get paid? We just do this? He goes, well, kind of, you get minimum wage. And I'm like, I thought I made like 15 to 20 something dollars an hour. He goes, well, that's if they hire you, then you get, you know, paid more. And I'm like, they hire me. I'm like, well, how do I do that? And he goes, he hands me this, this sheet with the prices of personal training. So I'm like, okay, cool. That's all I need to know. So that day I sold almost, I think almost $2,000 in training with the next three guests. He comes in the next work the next day and he was so, so pissed off. But I was one of those dudes that it's just, I talked and that was my thing. But right. most people need some of that training, especially if you go into fitness with a passion for fitness and a disdain for sales. Mm -hmm. How many trainers have a disdain for sales? Well, the irony in that a to lot. me is so, it's crazy how any other profession you could think of you know, when you're when you're training or you're learning the craft, you're learning the job. You're spending 80, 90 percent of the time learning the skill sets that you'll need to excel at that job. For some fucking weird reason, personal training is different. I I don't know a single successful personal trainer that won't tell you that that the skill set of having 
a sales background or learning sales is not a majority of your job. You're selling yourself at all times. If you can't, and even when you have all that information and knowledge, if you can't convey that to the person sitting across from you, it's worthless. Yeah, getting, so, getting clients is good sales, keeping them as being a good trainer. Right. So if you're a good mm-hmm. trainer with shitty sales, you can't get to that next step, right? Because you never got no, them in the first place. But, but don't, don't cap. Didn't you guys find that crazy that they didn't put a lot? Like even your all your national certifications, like all certifications to become a trainer that everybody goes after. Like, oh, this is the best one or do this. Like there's no fucking training. Nothing, Nothing around Nothing. that. But yet I, 80% uh, of the job is that. I We've we've talked about this ad nauseum, just mm-hmm. us. But I this was something I thought about for a long time. I said, if I ever made a certification, I'd want to have the best results in terms of successful trainers not necessarily trainers who know the most shit that will be part of it too but trainers who afterwards can write back and be like hey because your certification they're thriving i'm a successful personal trainer so when you know when i first heard of bedros and what he was doing i was like well fuck like there's a huge like open market for that and the dude in that in that arena knows what he's talking about. He knows yeah. how to build, how to teach trainers and fitness professionals how to build their fucking business, and there's a huge need for it. Oh no, he came Absolutely. in when we were up and coming. He was the only one, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, there, everybody else was talking about what, the latest and greatest tool, the latest and greatest certification that came out, or whatever new supplement line was out. Like that was the talk of trainers forever, except for Bedros. Bedros was this guy that was pushing these sales summits, right? And he was the, the marketing guy. Mm-hmm. And I remember uh, part of the reason why <clears throat> I didn't buy into a lot of his stuff is because there was, uh, in in my area, in my circle, there was a lot of kind of hate towards him. It was like a lot of people hated on him because he was this sales and market guy. And, he, oh, he's not a real trainer. He doesn't know shit about fitness and this and that. That's so crazy. That was the attitude towards him. And I didn't know enough to at that time that didn't promote me to go research him. I just thought like, Oh, okay. Like I, I'm the new kid on the block. I don't know much about this guy. Yeah. And I, you know, all these trainers are saying all the talking, all this shit, but I didn't know anybody that actually had gone through any of his summits. Then I get later on, later on in training, and I, all these successful trainers that I met that had gone through his through his training, I thought, okay, well, there's got to be something to this guy if oh, these yeah. are the trainers that are having the most success. You know, so I went to one of his summits, yeah, way back in the day. What year was that? Do you remember mm, when you went? I think it was like was uh, it before or after me? You it was after it was me. after you. Yeah, was it was when say. I was independent and I was on my own, and it was just like I I needed more information as far as like how to like market myself online and uh got a lot of valuable information from his summit from a lot of speakers that he brought in and it was it was great man like literally like you said nobody else was was like listening to this guy and like i i I was at a point where i was just focused on business and he was the only guy that was like there with a voice for Mm -hmm. how to market yourself as a fitness professional uh online Absolutely. I mean, uh, it, there's a huge market for it. There's a huge need for it. It's arguably the most important skill uh, or, or or set of skills you can learn if you want to be a successful trainer. You definitely need to know how to train people. You need to know exercises. You need to know all that stuff. That's a f- given though, right? You're a trainer. Obviously, you, sh- you need to know that stuff. You can't be crap and you can't hurt people. But the other part, which isn't so given, is the other half of your job is knowing how to build your business, and I don't care if you work in a gym where you work for a big company like a, a LA Fitness or 24 Fitness or whatever, or, and especially if you're private, if you don't have those skills, then you are, the odds that you're going to succeed you're fucked. are slim to none. Right. Absolutely slim to none. So uh, in this interview, we talked to Bedros uh, and we talked to him about uh, what he does. We talked to him about him and his story. He's got a very fascinating story. I did, was not privy to a lot of it, and he, he talks uh, in depth. The guy will not does not shy away from questions. It gets uh, pretty intense uh, in a couple moments uh, or in a couple sections of this interview. And the guy's just he's an open book, which I really it's a appreciate. great it's a great interview too, just for just entrepreneurship in general. Like, oh, so huge! Even, so even if you're yeah. not a personal trainer, but you're building a business, I mean, there's a lot of gems and lessons to. Uh, from this episode and like sal said you'll definitely hear a couple times where he gets riled up for sure oh he gets really riled up now i will say this if you are a trainer and you're listening and you do want more tools for skill i will say this this is why we created prime and prime i was just gonna say if you want if you want obviously learn how to sell yourself market yourself you're gonna get a little bit of that in this episode uh where we talk a little bit about that but if you also want to invest in the skill of being a trainer and get the most return 
easily I could say, um, and I'll debate anybody, anybody with this, if you want to build your value as a trainer, learn how to correct imbalances, learn how to promote uh, excellent recruitment patterns, learn how to improve mobility. For the average client, that will give you way more return in terms of business than almost any other skill, like learning how to just train someone real hard, make them sweat and all that other stuff. Most people, if you can solve their pain issues, get them to move more, mm. that translates to real life very quickly. Pain and clients are lifers. It's for, it's, that's the thing, 100%. Yeah. Now, our programs, Prime and Prime Pro, were specifically designed to be tools to be used for either yourself or if you're a personal trainer, you can get these two together in a bundle, which is uh, discounted. Um, and these are tools you can use on any client. You could take them, apply them, and then start to individualize them. And your clients, in terms of your skill, will get tremendous amount of value. The other thing, too, is this Bro, month- don't forget, too, it's 30 days, 30 days money back guaranteed. So if you do not see how much it fucking helps your business right. out, helps your, then fucking return the That's thing. right. And it also comes with free forum access this month. So on our forum, we have a private forum, a nice chunk of people in there are personal trainers. So it's a great way to- be a part of a training community, talk to other people about training clients, building a business, if you have questions, whatever. And then, of course, Adam, Justin, and myself are all on uh, that forum daily as well. To get access to the Prime and Prime Pro programs or the bundle with the free forum access, just go to mindpumpmedia.com. Um, now, Bedros Koulian, you can find him on his website. That's Bedros Koulian, B E D R O S K E U. I L I A N dot com. Uh, you can find him on Instagram at Bedros Koulian, and he has a podcast called Empire Podcast Show. So, without any further ado, here we are interviewing Bedros Koulian. I bought a building by mistake, which was across the street from the men's prison in Chino Hills or in Chino. So, I bought a different office building, and then I was stuck with this what we call the million dollar mistake a giant <laughs> 6,000 square foot industrial building. I'm like, fuck it, we're gonna build out BK Strength. My coaching clients who come out and work with me can work out there. My staff, I got a staff of 40, can work out there and I can work out there. No more 24 hour fitness or LA fitness gym. So it's got a nice lobby area that we're building out. And so I'm gonna do a the BK Strength. It's basically you know, comedians and cars getting coffee. Mm-hmm. Mm. Entrepreneurs and people who interest me and fascinate me working out, talking business or whatever they're. I just found that Netflix series. Did you have you guys found what he just he oh, mentioned yeah, right now? Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, 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 I just yeah. found oh, that. Oh, the comedians in cars. Yes. Yeah, I thought yeah, you mean yeah. like the gym version. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's you know, me. <laughs> I mean, back, you know, people used to go on the golf course to talk business and make connections, yeah. but you got a gym. Dude, you yeah. know, gym's a great way to do it. Oh, yeah. How many times have you like met someone and like, hey, let's go get a workout in, and you in between sets, you just talk, talk brilliance because you got the dopamines going, the endorphins going, like all the great. You're vulnerable oh, because you're stimulates. in pain, you're right. sweating, yeah. you're not looking right. your best necessarily or whatever. It's right. great. And and the whole time the guys are, you know, I got a team of four videographers and the guys are going to catch us shooting the shit the whole time. Yep. And then we finish it up in the lobby, having a protein shake or whatever, a high protein meal and peace out. That's a great, it's a great so it'll business. it'll be just video then. That, that's yeah, it's going to be all, yeah. all YouTube and then we'll just strip the audio and put it nice. in. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So now you have a, and I, you've told this story on other podcasts. So, but there's parts of this that I think are just, our audience needs to hear if they don't, if they're not familiar with it, that are absolutely, I mean, gems. They tell a lot about who you who are. You are. Yeah. And uh, like your family escaped uh, communism, Soviet, you, so the yeah. Soviet Union. You guys came to the U.S., were extremely poor. Like, tell us about that story. How old were you when that all happened? What was that like? Yeah, man. So my dad was uh, part of the Communist Party. And uh, we lived in Armenia, which was under the Soviet rule. And in 1980, in 81, my brother was going to join the Red Army. And of course, the Soviet Union was at war with Afghanistan, just like we are at mm-hmm. war with Afghanistan now. And my dad's like, the hell if my son's going to go and fight a war that he doesn't believe in. And, you know, all these Soviet uh, soldiers were dying. My brother's significantly older than me. So he was about to go. So my dad saves up all this money um, and bribes the Soviet government. And we escape into Italy in June 15th, 1980. I was six years old. So we escape, go to Italy, from Italy to the American consulate. And that's when they were doing the whole, hey, if you're a communist and you want to come to the United States, uh, and get your freedom, come on in, we'll take you. And so we entered the United States legally on June uh, June 16th. So actually we left, I'm sorry, we left around June 1st, June 2nd, and by the time we entered the United States, it was June 15th, 16th, 
JFK. We landed there from there to California. My dad had under 200 bucks in his pocket. Family of five. I was the baby of the family, six years old. And uh, man, it was quite the fucking shocking experience of all this. I grew up eating caviar as a kid. When your dad's a member of the Communist Party, you're eating caviar in the morning. Oh, wow. Like it was, it was you know, sourdough bread with butter on it and, and a slow scoop of caviar. My mm. mom would put 10 to 20 pieces out and give me tea. And I remember that as a four or five year old kid. So now we come to the United States and I'm crying for caviar and we're, <laughs> we're literally eating out of dumpsters. and right. Living in a, in a two bedroom apartment, right? That's yeah. You, yeah, a two bedroom apartment. Some guy rented out one of his spare bedrooms to us. So he was using one bedroom. So a family five in one of his spare bedrooms. Damn. And we kept moving around getting evicted. And one of the places we lived was so shitty, I got lice as a kid. And um, you know we couldn't afford lice treatment. We were broke, we were poor, didn't speak English, didn't understand the culture. And my mom made my dad siphon out gasoline from a car and she washed my hair in the grassy area. That's the old school way wow. of treating yeah. lice. Yeah, that's it. I mean, he's like, well, we can't afford lice treatment. We have to buy food, right? And so that's kind of how you survive. And we were dumpster diving on a nightly basis, you know, behind grocery stores, foods that are expired that have to get thrown away, but aren't necessarily bad mm -hmm. yet, right? And so, you know, I jokingly say that I was the breadwinner because my dad would hoist me up into the dumpsters. I was the smallest one. <laughs> and I'd pull out, you know, bread and, and cheese and, and milk and lettuce. And my mom would just peel off the bad leaves until we got to the core of the lettuce and it was fresh. Let's do this. Let's eat. And so it was a pretty interesting upbringing. But through all that adversities and, and the resourcefulness, those are all the things that I use now in business as an entrepreneur to thrive, so. And that's why it's so fascinating. Now, what, was it just your brother going to fight that that motivated you guys to escape? Because that's a very, I don't think people realize, like if you get caught escaping, they'll put you to death, especially if you're part of the Communist Party. Right, because right. he was part of the 18%. Only 18% of the population was part of the party. And so to denounce communism and escape, like if my Ooh. dad was caught, it's over, it's dead. How did he say, because I heard you on another podcast talk about how your dad saved the money because yeah. it, when you're under communist rule, you work for the state, you really don't get extra money. No. But people don't realize at the times those countries had massive black markets because people would try to figure out ways to. Exactly. And the black market was huge there. Just like if, if you if you worked in the flower shop for the state, well, maybe a couple of uh, dozen roses disappeared and then got sold under the table and that person made some extra money that way. So my dad oversaw a men's clothing manufacturing center he had all these tailors working under him. And he knew that, I forget what the number was, but I think they gave him so many yards of material and he could make 13 suits out of it. Well, he figured out that if he has his tailors put the patterns really tightly close together, for every, like, whatever, 20 some odd suits, he can come up with enough material for one extra suit. Oh, wow. And he would take that home. And of course, he used to be a tailor before he was you know, the uh, overseer of these guys. And he took enough material home and he'd make suits and he'd sell it to KGB agents. KGB guys would come to our house. Shut the fuck yeah, up. The and guys that black were going, market. Right, right. The mm -hmm. guys that were, because they're, they're going to buy cheaper from my dad, right? Mm -hmm. And so the guys that were supposed to ultimately put him in jail or send him off to Siberia wow. were buying from him. And he did this for years, like throughout the late 70s and raised 25,000 rubles and bribed the right member in the in the Soviet government where we were able to escape into Italy. And we escaped under the guise of my mom has a sister in Italy, which she didn't, and we're gonna go visit her her sister. Because if we said, hey, we're going to the United States. No way. No way. It's over. Yeah, yeah. you would've been executed. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously you're, you're extremely successful, very hardworking, but you started very, in a very difficult situation. You come to the US, you have no money. You said your dad had under $200. Yeah. I find, and maybe it's maybe it's just my own perception, but it seems like people who come from other countries that are so oppressed that come to a country where there's more opportunity, even though they start off very difficult, they tend to do well. Are the rest of your siblings like you, or in the sense that are they, have they found their way and are successful, or were you the anomaly in the family? I am the anomaly, but keep in mind, I'm also the youngest. My brother is 14 years older than me. My sister is 16 years older than me. My sister works for me. She does all my customer support for my digital info products from home and hangs out with my parents. And um, when I say hangs out with my parents, like, you know, takes care of my parents. Yeah. They're in their 80s. And thank God they're in good health. Uh, my brother's a real estate agent, does well for himself. And um, yeah, so I guess we do, we do, we do well. But it's, it's because of this immigrant edge. I call it the immigrant edge. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Gary Vaynerchuk, Elon Musk, Peter Thiel, 
uh, PayPal found. Like when you have lived in oppression, uh, whether communist rule or whatever kind of rule where life didn't offer you much, you can come to a country like this and even in the worst case scenario, you can see opportunity when one's not present. You can be resourceful when resources are not around. You can take disadvantages and turn them into advantages. Uh, Gary Vaynerchuk did in 2009. He started VaynerMedia um, you know, on the tail of the biggest economic crash we've ever mm -hmm. had. I started Fit Body Bootcamp, one of the nation's largest and fastest growing franchises, same year, 2009. And in fact, one of my videographers at the time was like, he literally stopped filming and he goes, what are we doing right now? Why are you even making a pitch video to sell a franchise when there's 12% unemployment rate? I go, the money didn't disappear, Rob. His name is Rob. So the money just exchanged hands. And my job is to figure out who got the money and sell them this franchise and teach them how to be successful. And so I constantly see resourcefulness and opportunity where others don't, but it's because I come from a place of mm -hmm. oppression. And well, I think that's that immigrant my, edge. My dad says the same. So my parents are both immigrants. They were very poor uh, Sicilians. And my dad used to tell me the same thing. And another thing that they, my parents told me was, you know, when you live in a poor country without much opportunity, you learn to lie a lot, you know, like whether it's selling something on the black market or figuring out a way to create your own opportunity, but that's against the rules. And he says, you live in a kind of a life that's not necessarily as honest as when you come to a place where you can be very honest, there's lots of opportunities and you can make things happen without fear of prosecution or without fear of people taking your stuff away yeah. from you necessarily. And so my dad, you know, did very well as a result coming over here, worked very hard. And so I'm very familiar with kind of this, you know, what you're talking about, the immigrant edge. What got you from this? Now you come over here. How did you get into fitness? I, I heard a little bit about your story. I guess you, it was a way to improve your confidence and that's yeah. what kind of changed <laughs> there, your, there was a girl involved. Yeah. Was girl oh, involved. Usually. Yeah. Yeah. So imagine when you're eating out of the dumpsters as a kid, right? Growing up, you kind of develop a palate for white bread and bologna and Velveeta <laughs> cheese and peanut butter and sugar. And so that, palate kind of continues throughout elementary school and junior high and high school. And so as I entered high school, I was 35 pounds overweight. Like I had like young man tits. I don't know how else to describe <laughs> I, I had sharp tits, but they weren't, they weren't you, you couldn't milk me, but otherwise I had tits. Madonna looking. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I started the fad before she did. <laughs> yeah. And uh, here's the funny part is around, around junior year of high school, I'm like, man, prom's coming up, you know, and there's this girl named Nakaya who I had the hots for. She had no idea that I had the hots. By the way, she, does she know what you do now? Have you talked no, to her? No, everybody asks me that. I, <laughs> I suppose I can look her up one day on social media, but <laughs> what, what's the point? Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Wife wouldn't love that one. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the Check, fuck you doing looking checking, at my high school yeah, yeah, sweetheart? Yeah, yeah. Checking my search yeah, yeah, history, yeah. right? <laughs> and so um, the summer before senior year, I start reading Flex Magazine, mu uh, Muscle and Fitness, every muscle magazine I can get, get my hands on. And a, and a guy... And I was a pariah in school, by the way. Like every, no kid wanted, the, the, the nerds didn't want anything to do with me because I got bad grades. The jocks didn't want anything to do with me because I was a horrible athlete. I was not an athlete. Even the gothic kids, like I, I didn't have all the cool stuff to wear because my parents- <laughs> You were just, depressed enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I was slightly Shit. too happy. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And so I hated lunchtime because I would just walk around the quad until lunch was over. But thankfully I had one friend, he, was the cent he played the center on the high school football team in science class. We made friends because we were science partners. And he's like, hey, I'll take you into the gym. So I learned to work out through Muscle and Fitness Flex Magazine. I learned, you know. The basics. The basics, right. the very raw basics of eating well, which is don't eat sugar <laughs> and uh, don't eat white bread, yeah. right? Don't eat bologna. And so that summer, dude, I lost the 30 pounds. I come back senior year, more confident, more self-aware. Um, people are like, man, you're a whole new person. But I never had the balls to ask Nakaya out to the prom. So I never made it to the prom. She never knew that I had the hots for her. Probably still doesn't. <laughs> but that changed my trajectory. I was supposed to be a smog technician. Well, I imagine, right, that's probably when that first, that was probably your first real taste of health and fitness and yeah. you're probably loving it, right? It was oh, right dude, you're getting attention. It's transformative. It is. Yeah. It is. You On more than just the yourself. physical level. And every level. The mm -hmm. biggest transformations, in fact. You're absolutely right, Sal. Came to me in self-esteem, self-image, and self-awareness, not actual physical change, right? Even though I had lost 30 pounds of fat, which is substantial for a young man. And, uh, and, and so I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to be a smog technician. I'm going to help more people do this. And I'm like, and I remember when I was reading the muscle and fitness magazines, seeing a little ad in the very back of the thing that said, get certified as a personal trainer, earn $100 an hour. Yeah. I could do the math. So if I train just six clients a day, that's 600 bucks a day. 
I'm going to be rich. Right. right? Mm-hmm. So I did the math, got certified, zero clients. <laughs> so I was a certified personal trainer through the American Council on Exercise, uh, fry cook at Disneyland. And then in the winter times, I have a lot of nieces and nephews. I was a bouncer at a gay bar. All that just to make ends meet. Yeah. Now, I heard I heard you say that on uh, Sean's podcast, and w- what led you to go to a gay bar to be a bouncer? Very good question. So, Disneyland is the happiest place on earth. Okay, so you're not trying to figure out your own sexuality. <laughs> no, right no, 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 no. No, Disneyland being the happiest place on earth has a lot of gay employees. It, it, it truly oh, does. really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I didn't like, know that. You walk into any other store... And I don't know what the straight to gay population is as far as employees are concerned. Let's say whatever, 80 to 80, 20, right? Uh, it's probably more like 60, 40 uh, in Disneyland, you know, wow. 40%, 50% being gay. So I made a lot of gay friends. And one day I was just griping about, man, I don't have enough clients. I only had like three clients. I don't have enough personal training clients. I'm not getting paid enough here as a, as a fry cook at Disneyland. I'm just griping. And one of my gay friends is like, hey, man, um, you know, there's a bar that I go to. They pay $14 an hour for bouncers. Um, whereas the other bouncer job down the street for a straight bar is like nine bucks. I'm like, well, shit, hang out with you guys all day long here at work. What's wrong with hanging out at night? Right. Right. And what he didn't tell me, the reason they were paying more is because skinheads would come at night Uh, to gay bash. mm, Wow. And I'm not a fighter. Like I'm a big guy, but I don't fight. I can talk my way out of any fight. I can hug you and make you love me. Like (laughs) I don't want to fight. So next thing I know I'm getting into fights. Right. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't like that, but I did enjoy working there because I got to learn to talk my way out of fights and to calm down situations. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's like objection conquering. Right. That's sales mm-hmm. skills. Yeah, it really is. Mm-hmm. And you know, we were talking about sales skills earlier. Like I got to really fine tune my sales skills on highly angry, emotional people and talk them down. What a great training ground. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And only the first week and a half you get groped. And after that, you're like, Hey, I'm straight. I'm straight. I'm straight. <laughs> yeah. And after that, everyone's cool with you. Yeah. So it was a, it was a fun experience, but I remember thinking there is no cop who's also a bouncer or a, I don't know, a doctor who's also a fry cook. Why in the fitness industry do we have these side jobs? And so that's really when I started kind of searching out a way to, can I do this full time? Hmm. Yeah, that's when that really happened. And of course, that's when one of my clients took mercy on me and goes, here's a Tom Hopkins sales tape. You're, you're in, he goes, you're an order taker, not a closer. Listen to this tape every night until you learn how to sell. That's so funny. I, Tom Hopkins is the first sales course I ever took. Yeah. They, 24 Fitness actually hired Tom to, to create like some... I think it was what mastering was it the sales, mastering the uh, the art, art of, of sales. membership sales. Yeah. Right, mm-hmm. and he taught you know tie downs and you know you know you had to overcome objections, circling all the thing. wagon, all circling that wagon. I mean, I learned all those first through Tom Hopkins. It's hilarious that you did the same thing. Yeah. Didn't you mm-hmm. say he's like, in, yeah, not such, yeah, not such good. A good a good friend recently told me that he's I don't know somewhere in Ventura County, not in the best place. Really? Terrible. Yeah, financially, mm. yeah. Mm. You know what, I think I think a lot of people, and especially people like you, like myself, uh, that didn't come from a lot, uh, you know, a lot of our motivation is is to have things or to, to build a business or be successful. And then you kind of get there and you realize that there's, there's more to it. It's not, that doesn't fulfill you the way you thought. Did you ever go through that? Like, were you... You know, chasing this, you know, going from eating government cheese and, and and bread and dumpster diving to all becoming this multimillionaire and then all of a sudden going like, fuck, I'm not that much as happy as I thought I would be. Were you ever like that? You know, I can't say that I was throughout my career as I ventured into other businesses that didn't have to do with helping people. I was like, I don't like this. Mm-hmm. And ironically, I shut all those down mm-hmm. or had a fallout with all the business partners in those areas. But anything that has to do with personal training, fitness, nutrition, where I get to help people, I just love. So I actually stumbled upon my passion and my purpose early on in life, thanks to that 30 pounds of fat that I had to lose. When I've diverted and gone into other spaces, for a little while I I was in the dating niche. Not me, because I've got no game, (laughs) but a business partner. Mm. It wasn't fulfilling. Mm -hmm. To help young men get laid, mm, good luck. I, I didn't get laid, I turned out all right. You know, go suffer. Like, I don't actually, I don't want you to get laid. How about yeah, yeah, that? Yeah. Right. That'll build more character. Yeah. Right. Blue right. balls. All day. Yeah. Cause yeah. that, that, that gives you a chip on your shoulder to go and do something different. Go sell something. Mm-hmm. Right. Sure. Yeah. So anyway, so, um, whenever I venture outside of my, my lane, 
I realize I'm not happy. Hmm. Now, how- when when did the success start to come? Because now you're a trainer, you're learning how to build that business. W- when did that start to take off? Yeah, so Jim Franco, one of my personal training clients, who was this kind of rough and tumble older dude in his 60s, he'd work out with me. I trained him Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 2.30 in the afternoon. And I would see that, you know, he'd roll up in a different car, a Mercedes, a Cadillac Escalade, some sporty car, I didn't know what it was at the time. It was ended up being a 64 Shelby Cobra uh, Ooh, replica, yeah. Well, right? Ooh, yeah. 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 And I was like, Jim, like all those cars, you come here, are you retired? He's like, no, I have a job, I have an office, but I leave early and I come work out here. I go, how do you make your money? He goes, I take a little bit of money from a lot of people. Those were magical transformational words for mm. me. And I hope anyone listening to this, it, it could serve them well as uh, also. I take a little bit of money from a lot of people. Well. He owns a software company that serves independent auto parts stores. Like uh, if you owned your own version of, a, of a Pet Boys, mm-hmm. right? And you know the software has to be updated because Fram oil filters are changing the part numbers, et cetera. Right. And so he's charging these guys like $99 a month. And there's literally thousands of these private auto parts stores. And so I go, well, how can I do that? He goes, hey, dummy, you're selling me 10 sessions at a time while the gym is charging me a membership fee. I have to pay $40 a month to come into the gym, but you keep selling me chunks of training at a time. So I was probably one of the first guys, if not the first guy in our industry, to switch from 60-minute workouts to 30-minute workouts, Mm -hmm. and then to introduce EFT, electronic fund transfer. Yeah, month-to-month payments Mm -hmm. on a $600 to a $800 a month program. So I started selling, I was like, well, if he's taking a little bit of money from a lot of people, I can take a lot of money from a little bit of people, Mm -hmm. right? And the math will work out the same, and it did as I learned sales skills through him and uh, ultimately opened up my five personal training gyms over a three year period. Ended up getting a really good offer. Here's the crazy stuff. The skill that he taught me how to take money automatically from people's bank accounts, right? Is the reason that my five gyms got bought out. They were buying my future receivables. You had had, a dues base. I had a dues base, thank you. Mm -hmm. So had I been making the same amount of money, but constantly selling blocks of sessions. You wouldn't have been worth nearly as much. No, sir. No, because you mm. can show when you do that, and this is, we learned this from working in the gym in the gym business. You can show that guaranteed, you know, monthly revenue, that annual revenue. Then usually you could sell your business for maybe two, three times that amount. A higher multiple. But if you don't have that, then it's maybe one time your amount or half mm-hmm. because exactly. you're not there. You're not the one selling it, basically. Exactly. At what exactly. what yeah. year was this, and then how much did you sell the five gyms for? So the year was two thousand and one. Okay. And I sold the five gyms for just two hundred thousand. It wasn't much. There was like tiny little personal training studios, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like twice the size of this room, each one. And uh, I was like, holy smokes, like I got a lot of money right yeah, now in sure. hand. Yeah, well, as the internet was taken off, I had also started, came up with this idea of High Tech Trainer, which was supposed to be an online personal training software. But except the idea was that it would be on Palm Pilots, because this is mm-hmm. pre-iPhone, mm-hmm. right? This is actually how I found you. Really, through yeah. High Tech Trainer? Yeah, because so mm-hmm. back back when I used to work at 24 Hour Fitness with these guys and then decided to leave and do my own thing. Yeah. And there was just nobody out there like speaking to business and fitness together. So uh, I kind of just put the search terms in there and then it kind of led me into you and, and High Tech Trainer yeah. and uh, in that direction. But I, I remember you saying on somewhere else where High Tech Trainer wasn't sort of your best product you put out No, there. man, it wasn't my best product. And yeah. so much of it has to do with you know, I was great at marketing the fitness software, but I didn't know how to code it or program it. So I had gotten someone who was a coder. <clears throat> he wasn't up to date on it. He wasn't as excited about the software as I was. So like the three of you are so jazzed about Mind Pump. Like this is, you guys live and breathe Mind Pump. And when you, you Sal, you even told me when you guys met, you guys were on the same wavelength. Like mm-hmm. this is what we want to talk about. The coder had one idea for it. I had another idea for it. So we're constantly in, in the struggle. In hindsight, Steve Jobs says, when you look back, the dots connect. <clears throat> I look back, the dots connect. We should have never started High Tech Trainer, especially with Apple coming up with iPhone a few years later. Mm-hmm. But we had these Palm Pilots and the idea was to sell it to gyms. And if you couldn't afford a personal trainer, you check out a Palm Pilot and you walk around the gym and it puts you through your workouts, oh, sets, reps, et cetera. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then you know videos and workouts. Actually a pretty good idea around that time. It was, yeah. and here's how- In theory. The, in theory, yeah. As a, the, the couple of clubs that actually allowed us to test it in, people were walking out with fucking Palm Pilots. Because, <laughs> right? Oh, thank you. Right? Yeah. No, don't leave. 
Right. <laughs> Didn't think yeah. about that part. No, no. Like, can we put a big chain on this thing? Can we zap them or something, right? So they're like, hey, like uh, half the Palm Pilots, each, each the two gyms that we tested with, we gave them each 15 Palm Pilots. Within like 35 days, half the Palm Pilots were oh, gone. Shit. Oh, shit. Yeah, no. I didn't know if it was gone by the staff or the fucking client. It doesn't matter. They're gone and they're like, hey, your Palm Pilots are gone. I'm like, mine? Like, yeah, yeah, they were yours. Shit. Right, I couldn't afford. So the, I burnt through the two hundred thousand dollars so quickly. Wow! But in that time, Sprint, I guess uh, one of the two gyms, there was a Sprint executive who worked out there, and they're like, "Hey, we like to put the workouts on this on our jukebox." It was their app store, and so for two dollars and fifty cents, Sprint was selling high tech trainer workouts, two dollars and fifty cents a month. A little bit of money from a lot of people, all of a sudden, right? And so this executive reached out to us and says, we'll do a 50-50 ref share on $2.50 recurring, but we have 26 million subscribers on their cell phones. Sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Right. I had a big surge in my revenue all of a sudden. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. So the app uh, or the Palm Pilot thing didn't work out so well, but thankfully it being out there, it caught the eye of someone who's like, I see a vision. So before there were apps, like I created the first fitness app and it was on the Sprint jukebox. Wow. Yeah. Well, I did not know that. Yeah. And, and you're making a buck 25 a person that's downloading yeah. it. Basically. Yeah. Now it wasn't from 26 million subscribers. Because, but that's a huge p a pool yeah, to pull yeah, from. Right. Yeah. The, but we're getting like 30 grand a month and I'd never seen that kind of money before. Oh, yeah. that's wow. crazy. Yeah. Now the, the, the quote, um, entrepreneurship is jumping out of a plane and making a parachute on the way down. Is that, do you think that's accurate? Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. That, that should be the definition, right? Yeah, yeah. It really, I mean, there's a great example of it. I, I, I didn't know how to open up gyms and my client Jim Franco taught me how to open up gyms. Like I just knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur and I was going to sell blocks of sessions and they were going to be one hour long. And he's like, dude, can you just deliver results in short amount of time? I'm like, yeah. He goes, how come the industry goes to one hour? I'm like, I don't know. I don't. So it's thinking differently. Entrepreneurship is thinking differently. It's taking a leap with Palm Pilots, realizing you're falling off the cliff. The Palm Pilots, not a parachute. Oh, look, Sprint Jukebox, that's the parachute. And if it wasn't that, as long as you're willing to keep trying to make a parachute, you will make one before you hit the ground. Most right. people just give up on the second or third attempt and then they go splat. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. When did you decide to help others in fitness build their own business? Well, wait a second. I want to know, you're, you're making 30, how old are you? You're making $30,000 a month at this point. Uh, any idea to put your feet up, buy some nice cars, cool, you know, take chicks out, have a good time? Like, are you still driven to do more? What's going on in your head? By this point, I was married. I was, uh, okay. so it was 2003, 2004. Okay. My wife and I got married in 2003. And uh, I'm like, hey, we bought a little house in Chino Hills. Cool. That felt good. Um, no fancy cars, but we were sharing one beat up Ford Taurus. And now she had a car. I had my own car, which was great. And they were both new cars. I had like a Chevy Tahoe and I think she had like a Toyota Camry or something but better than the four tourists that kept overheating that we shared. Um, so it was that kind of lifestyle change. Like we went from drinking water to spring water. We went from regular canned tuna to albacore tuna. And those things mattered because <laughs> I was like saying, oh my God, my lifestyle's improving, right? We bought a dog. Uh, so, so no, I wasn't balling by any stretch of the imagination because I also had a business partner and high tech trainer, right? Okay, got you. Yeah. The, so you're the, not actually the, the walking away with $30,000 no, a month quite no. yet. Well, okay. we all have a business partner, Uncle Sam. He takes away anywhere from, oh, yeah, there's don't right, that part. from 30% yeah. to 40%. Good point. I don't remember reason. signing the that contract. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's the guy really telling you what to do. Exactly. <laughs> and then, of course, then you have another business partner, which is your business partners. Um, so, But I was taking enough where we were bringing home like probably five, $6,000 a month, okay. personal income, my wife and I, because mm -hmm. she worked in high-tech trainer with us. And I was like, this is really cool, man. I don't have to be in a gym, running my gyms, selling training programs. Um, and I got to a point where I was the, the district manager of my own gyms. Mm. But I was still floating around between my five gyms, you know, making sure my managers are selling. So the fact that I could work off a laptop, a, a Toshiba laptop at the time, um, it felt good and I saw the vision. So I said, I think there's more here. And the other thing I was doing is we had scraped the internet for email addresses for personal trainers. I didn't know what an opt-in page was. This is 2003, 2004, right? So I would type in, let's say, San Jose personal trainer. I'd find your website, scrape your email address. Add it was to probably me. Yeah, that's, that's how I got you, man. And, I uh, own that. Yeah. <clears throat> And, and we would add you to constant contact, our email database. So we had 1,400 people in that database, and I would send out an email every single day. Horribly written, no direct response. I would use the best salesmanship I could, but there was no infotainment. Today mm -hmm. I talk about infotainment. I, I give information and I entertain in my videos, blog posts, emails, et cetera. Back then it was just blah, right? Here's how you make money as a personal trainer. 
I would throw up information digitally. And um, trainers would reply back and go, man, I wish I was as consistent with my emails to my prospects and clients as you are with yours. I go, well, if we created a content-rich email that you could send out automatically every week, would you? Would you pay me money for it? Yeah. Created Fit Pro Newsletter, which today is a $3 million a year software that I own. Wow. For 10 years now. And Fit Pro Newsletter is like automated eye contact or e, e, was it MailChimp or whatever. Mm -hmm. But for the fitness industry, done for you broadcast. We write the content. It goes out on, on your behalf to your clients and prospects. But again, it's jumping off the cliff and making the parachute, listening to the market space. Enough, enough trainers tell me, I wish I was as consistent as you. I'm going to go, what if you don't have to be? What if I do the work for you? And that's where I quickly learned, instead of teaching them do it yourself, make it done for you. And my business really started to change when I started teaching done for you marketing instead of go do it yourself. Hmm. And how, that was around two. How long did it take to scale it up to where it was making that much money? Oh man, um, four or five years. Okay. Yeah, in fact, probably four years to make the first million with High Tech Trainer, and then um, probably another two three years after that. And then now, now we're starting or, to make or fit pro news. Now our lifestyle is really changing now. Yes. Okay. Lifestyle is really challenging, yeah. changing now. Still, we've got the motivation and drive to continue to grow and get bigger. Where's that coming from? Because I realized uh, by this point, biggest loser was hitting television mm -hmm. and Jillian Michaels, of course, was pretty, pretty hot. Right. And, um, everyone's like, man, she's an awesome trainer. She's like America's trainer. I'm thinking like, no, she's not. I am. I am <laughs> because through all these thousands of personal trainers who are using, High Tech Trainer, Fit Pro Newsletter, and now buying Closed Clients and PT Business Course, my two courses of selling and marketing. Through them, I'm probably impacting more end users right. than she is, but no one knew of me. But in my head, I'm like, fuck that. I always had someone that I was battling in my head. There's another mm -hmm. thing, right? Right. And so it was, the first one was Jillian Michaels. Right. And I'm like, she's not America's best trainer. I am, I'm impacting more lives just through all these other trainers. And so, it, it really felt good, but to me, it was always service. I was still the trainer, just not hands-on. Where, so where did that chip come from? Where do you think that chip came from? Have you guys read Relentless, Tim Grover? No, I have not. Mm. Great book, highly recommend it. He was the personal trainer for Michael Jordan when the Bulls trainer couldn't okay. deliver the results. Tim Grover was called in, and he ultimately ended up being the trainer for Charles Barkley, Kobe Bryant, Dwayne Wade, like you name the no shit. best and badass. I can't believe I heard that book. Great book, Relentless, read it. And when you do, you're, you're gonna see there's a section where he talks about, um, he's working with Dwayne Wade, getting him through an injury, but he's still self-conscious about the injury. Hey, maybe I'm not gonna be the best as I'm, as I'm gonna be. And he tells Dwayne, I want you to go on that court and bring 48 minutes of controlled rage to your opponents. And when he said that, I was like, holy fuck. And I read the book just this past year in 2017. I told my wife, I go, you got to listen to this part because I was, it was an audio book. I go, I've been bringing controlled rage for 15 years to the fitness industry. And where it came from was when I said, hey, American Council on Exercise, I'm doing 30 minute workouts. Let me come speak at IDEA, right? Because they, they're in cahoots with IDEA. Rejection letter. Hey, NSCA, let me come teach fitness marketing because I was the personal trainer for I Cook and a bouncer. And I'm sure, and I know there's a whole bunch more trainers who are also having side jobs. No, we don't need that. They just constantly wanted to teach more Pilates and certification and core strengthening. And what is that with academia and like right? just, just not like interweaving some kind of yeah. a business structure yeah. into their protocol? And listen, I love Peter Davis to death, and 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 I ran into him at, at an event two years ago, and I go, "Hey, Peter, twice I got rejected from Idea. Like he's the CEO of Idea. He goes, oh, I wasn't part of the panel that whether you're part of the panel or not, man." We need marketing and sales information. Like you three met because you guys understood sales and you guys are now doing this and you're still selling. You're selling knowledge, information, and wisdom, right? Our fucking fitness industry is so ass backwards. Yeah. Ass backwards. 100%. Any certification organization does not, not a single paragraph of learn to sell or market yourself. I tell right. you, I, I, had, uh, I had countless trainers with very little knowledge on fitness who became extremely successful trainers because they were good at communicating their ideas and what they, and of course the knowledge can be learned and they right. became excellent trainers. And then on the other hand, I would have trainers that come to me with a master's degree in sports medicine or four different certifications and they just did not take that communication part seriously and failed. They just didn't succeed. Yeah. That's such and a big bitter part and of angry it. about it because they know how smart they are. They compare right, themselves right. to the other trainers and they see these guys that maybe not have as much on, knowledge rule, as they do. Rule number one, like a client is gonna if they're gonna work with you for 
one to three days a week for hopefully years, they got to like you. Yeah. That's like rule number one. If you're not a likable person, you can't communicate well. Right. I don't care. It doesn't matter how knowledgeable you are. Well, they let's pull talk Google. about the personal training market, like that being a, a really tough market to be able to kind of impact because everybody has such big egos yeah. uh, in the space. And like you're talking about kind of m- making things turnkey for them, which I think is, is really the only way you can do it in, in the space. Yeah. Well, I learned very quickly that I can't come to you as a trainer and go, Hey man, I know you're great. You got the, uh, the masters, you got all, you got the NSCA distinguished strength coach, et cetera. I had to wait for you to feel the pain of being mm-hmm. broke. Right. So the young trainers in the mid to early thirties, like 31, all the way up to 31, 32, they were not my fans when I would reach out to them. Mm-hmm. Cause Hey man, I got this. You don't understand. Yeah, I think they know more than you yeah. already. Once they open up their gym, sign a lease, buy equipment, all this stuff, and then the the wife or the fiance is going, hey, motherfucker. <laughs> We're not making it <laughs> We're broke. Yeah, yeah, go get a job. <laughs> Guess what they do? A little Google search called fitness marketing, mm-hmm. right? Or personal trainer business secrets. And so I realized very quickly, I need to dominate these key words. And so I started two blogs, PT Power and Renegade Fitness Marketing. And I just owned the 25 key words in my space that wow. I knew struggling trainers would look for. Because mm-hmm. I would start reaching, some those who reached out to me, I'm like, how did you find me? Uh, fitness marketing expert, fitness marketing specialist. So much fucking brilliance in that, dude. Yeah. Oh, yeah so sure. I said, I'm going to wait till you're in pain, and then you'll look for me, and you'll spend money. But when I come to you, like, fuck you, get away, Bedros. The reason you weren't successful is you don't have a PhD or a master's, because mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't have any of that stuff, mm-hmm. right? I was an enthusiastic trainer. And I was telling you guys earlier, my enthusiasm is what helped people show up and get workouts and get results. Which, te- which seems to bug the fuck so out underrated. of really yeah. it, academia. Which do you, I don't know why. Did you get a lot of pushback with that? Have you had battles with that? My whole life I've been the black sheep in this industry. I man. bet. I bet. Could people hate on that guy. Yeah. They hate on the guy that's doing right. really, really well in fitness, but he doesn't have a PhD yeah. in, in one of the fields. I don't know where every muscle originates and inserts. I don't. I still don't. I'm 43. <laughs> and some of the best PhDs are now my clients in the industry, right? right. Like mm-hmm. like Dr. Dan Ritchie and Dr. Cody Seip, you know, they, they I, actually, I co-own Functional Aging Institute with them and and Ben Pakulski that we talked about and Jason mm-hmm. Phillips and Vince Del Monte, all these motherfuckers are my clients and yet I can't get on the stages that they were getting on. So I was bringing so I had so much controlled rage as as Tim Grover says and I, in this industry that I brought EFT, went to 30 minute sessions, took the outdoor boot camp that everyone thought was a redheaded stepchild in our industry. Oh, outdoor boot camps, that's just how you make side money. It's like, no, we can bring that indoors now that mm-hmm. the economy's crashed, make it a legitimate fucking business and bring the cost of personal training down, make it more affordable and convenient to people. But I was like, it was like I was speaking fucking alienese, right? Yeah. right? The industry's like, you're wrong again. I'm like, I've been proven right four times motherfucker yeah, right. <laughs> now all of a sudden i can't catch lightning yeah, right yeah. right <laughs> these fucking hands are made to catch lightning you know there's the, the timing that you did that with i this is when i switched and transitioned into boot camps and i saw the writing on the wall with the with the crash i'm all sweaty I'm we went we went from we went from oh one to oh oh three oh four ish where it become it, especially in california it was like almost a trendy thing to have a trainer like if you had money you had a personal trainer right. and selling training was the easiest thing in the world for me and then from like 04 to 09 era, there's now all of a sudden we start to see this dip, the housing market crashes. Now everybody wants a personal trainer, but they're not, they can't afford it right. because their house is upside down $100,000. And that was like instant light bulb went off in my head. Okay, I got to find a way. I'm charging $100 an hour. These, these people are telling me they want to train with me. They just simply can't. And I believe them because I had a house at that time that was now $100,000 upside down. So I get it. So I thought I got to find a way to train more people for a lot less money and that was when I made that transition so you obviously were one of the leaders in that group so brilliant that you saw that and you made that move but yet still people just yeah giving they don't you want to recognize I'm a it. sellout yeah I'm a sellout what do I know personal training is it's in the name it's personal tra- you know how many emails and DMs I still get it's in the name personal training I'm like look dude if you want to go be a loser the rest of your life and not not have a life be my guest yeah. that's the reality if you do one-on-one personal training unless you're Gunnar Peterson right who I love to pieces where he can go hey guys like Tim Grover I'm going away for a while you guys are going to keep paying me and do the program that I wrote up for you that doesn't happen to regular Most personal people, trainers, no, right? No. Now, you, you're you super motivated by this competitive rage. Yeah. Like, that's what drives you. Yeah, but when it What is, happens when, yeah, when you're it, accepted, everybody likes you, because you're on your way, right? You're fucking great. Now, Bedros is the man. There's no more to fight. Like, what are you going to do? I'll find a fight. <laughs> <laughs> no, my, my life, I, I literally came out as a footling out of my mom, like foot first. And they pulled 
because this is what the communists do. They, they just pull you out. They don't straighten you out. You guys have kids? Yeah, I yeah. got two. Okay, so if you have kids, you know, yeah, I don't know if they came out, but you know, they're supposed to come out head first, yeah, right? Yeah, first. I came yeah. out the same way. Okay, so yeah. in America, a lot. yeah, they turn you, they turn you around, <laughs> right? Yeah. In Armenia, they just pull you right angry, out. Apparently, <laughs> yeah, 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 creates rage. Exactly. <laughs> I got the same thing. Thank yeah. you, yeah. thank you. And and so and so, I come out that way, of course. In the process, my mom's bleeding, and again, in a communist hospital for forty three days. Now my dad and my sister are boiling rice and feeding me rice water because there's no formula in communist Russia, right? So I come out as a footling. I'm living off rice water instead of breast milk, right? Um, fucking really bad things happened to me between the ages of four and, f uh, four and six in Armenia. Uh, really bad things that traumatized me sexually. Um, I think you get the picture. No point in going in a greater depth about that. I've talked about another podcast, but... So there's that. Come to America. You're being called Herman because your parents find a shirt, Herman Munster, from the dumpsters, right? And I wear the shirt, and now kids are calling you Herman. So much so that I start responding to them as Herman, That's introducing it. myself as Herman. Uh, I'm the foreign kid. Go back to your own fucking country. How many times have I heard that, right? Because uh -huh. I don't speak the language. Mm. And so I'm the fat kid who doesn't get the date. I'm the personal trainer who's constantly bucking the industry. So I'm always gonna have a fucking battle to fight. That's my lot in life and I love that. That's my fucking superpower and I love that. Well, it's also normally our Achilles heel too. So I, I, I would speculate that at one point because I've had a lot of people that I've helped in the same, same place. I'm a lot of this person too because I came from nothing. And so I've always had this chip and Lewis Howes talks about our, our mass, mass of masculinity, yes. right? And a lot of times, that that chip or that attitude that we have is uh, is the result of all of our success. So why the fuck would I want not want to do it? But then sometimes our body starts to rebel on us with either stress or anxiety or issues going on with your health. Did you ever start to have this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In fact, uh, so I'm 43 now. At 37, I had my first massive anxiety attack, mm -hmm. and it was so crippling that I thought I was having a heart attack. And, Where uh, were you? What were you doing? <laughs> I actually write write about this in my book, but uh, I, I was so. Imagine my house. I have a good life now. Uh, I live on a one and a half acre property. My house is here. There's a giant pool deck, big giant grassy area, then a separate garage, and above the garage is a guest house, a two bedroom guest house where Craig Ballantyne stays when he visits town. Um, which I got to talk to him about that, but that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> he leaves, is well, he overstaying his no, welcome? No, not, not that. He what the leaves, fuck, Craig? He leaves welcome. so many protein bars and, and, and <laughs> almonds and all this shit. I go up to the, I, I keep have a drum uh -oh. set in the guest house and, the, and, and uh, I end up eating all his shit. And even though it's healthy stuff, I still overconsume. <laughs> yeah. Every time he comes, like, Craig, take that shit He's with you. He's sabotaging you. He does, he yeah, does. But anyway, because yeah. I'm, I'm still a fat kid inside. Mm. But, but, but anyway, so uh, one morning I go to get something from the guest house and I, I'm 37 years old. I, I bend over to pick up my shoes. It was my shoes. I bend over to pick them up and I stand up and my throat's closing up. I get tunnel vision. I'm sweating. My heart's racing. I, I hear the thug lug, thug lug of my heart in, in my ears. All of a sudden, my arms start tingling. And That's, it's just out of nowhere. Dude, out of nowhere. It's like a Monday morning. I'm getting ready for work. I was going to head to the gym first. And I wasn't, didn't think much of it until my arms start tingling. And I remember reading somewhere that when your arm tingles or heart attack heart attack but I'm like both arms are tingling holy fuck this is the big one, <laughs> yeah, right? the one. <laughs> Again, guys I'm not the smartest fucking knife in a drawer I'll tell you that right now right I'm like I'm as sharp it's as a bowling explode. ball yeah, yeah I'm gonna die this oh, is shit. it fuck <laughs> so all I'm thinking and I, and I wrote this and I'm chuckling as I'm writing this all I'm thinking is my, my, my wife and kids are gonna find me sometime tonight in the guest house because they think I've left for work already by then rigor mortis is gonna set in I'm gonna be all stiff and bloated and the last way they remember daddy and the husband is stiff and bloated so my philosophy was, if I could, I know, crazy, right? If I could just stumble down, it's, I've already accepted death. Now it's like, how do I want to look when I'm dead? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's fucking twisted. <laughs> And <laughs> don't talk shit till you've been there, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. The good news is you accept death very quickly, fellas. Uh, I thought it's like, nah, you reconcile with it. No, no, no. I was like, okay, I'm going. Yeah. Uh, you know, now it's how am I going to be gone? How am right. I going to be found? So I go, if I could just get down the staircase across the pool deck. My wife will find me sooner before rigor mortis, before I get all fat and bloated and whatever. I just picture myself yellow and veiny, right? And then, yeah. and my Getting kids- in a certain pose or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll get into my best pose, exactly. Yeah. In the process of going down the staircase, I don't know if it was the fresh air or the movement, everything clears up. Tingling goes away, throat opens up. I can breathe again. My heart rate comes down to normal. I'm like, holy fuck, I just cheated death. I just dodged a heart attack bullet. And so, 
off to the gym I went. You didn't go to the doctor? No doctor. Jesus. <laughs> I know. No doctor. Went right to the office. Come home that night and tell my wife, like, hey, you're not going to believe what happened this morning. I uh, I cheated death, baby girl. How about that? Right? Doesn't that turn you on? She's like, what the fuck do you mean? I go, I think I had a heart attack, but thank God I'm in good shape. <laughs> Again, I'm ignorant to this, guys. So she goes, what do you mean? I go, so I explained the whole thing to her. She goes, dude. Tomorrow morning, we're going to the doctor. We go to urgent care. They do the whole EKG test on me. Like, your heart's fine. Are you stressed out? And she's like, yeah, he drinks NyQuil and takes a Vicodin to go to sleep every night, which I did. Um, not proud of it, but I was stressed out. Mm -hmm. right. At this point, Fit Body Bootcamp, the franchise that we started, is $640,000 upside down. I have this, like, like tense relationship, adversary relationship with my business partner. We only had five employees at the time, and I swear all of them had it out for me. And... Uh, it was just mounting. The stress was mounting. And so, boom, it came up as a big anxiety attack. So to answer your question, yeah, I did. And then subsequently, I had five or six more after that that wow. forced me to go seek out therapy because when I told my doctor about it that I can't control these anxiety attacks, he goes, well, here's Xanax. Well, of course. Now I'm waking up in the morning. I've got no motivation. I'm mm -hmm. drowsy. I'm foggy. I'm drooling out the side of my mouth. I'm like, nah, well, now this new franchise is surely going to go out of business, right? It's like, I, I can't take Xanax. I got to go find a therapist who can give me tools. I can't not be stressed. I just need to know how to cope with the stress right, right. now. That's the phase of life I was in. Um, so I went and found a therapist and the 16 months of work began. What, wow. are, you, what, what are you learning when you, going through this? Two very big things. And actually, stress and anxiety, people who suffer from stress and anxiety and anxiety attacks in general, Anxiety just comes from halt, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Those are the triggers, right? Mm. If you're hungry, you're angry, you're lonely, you're tired for a long time. And the way Kevin, my therapist, described it to me was if you're a former recovering alcoholic, if you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, halt, then you're more likely to go hit the bottle. If you're a former recovering drug addict, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, you're more likely to go hit the drugs. Mm. So as entrepreneurs who deal with anxiety and stress, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, you're about to have an anxiety attack. So control your halts was number one. Number two is anxiety is anticipation of future pain. He, he's like, this is a definition of it. Anxiety is anticipation of future pain. He goes, so let's, and he calls it the golden threat. He goes, give me a golden threat. I go, okay, uh, my business partner stresses me out. He goes, okay, great. What is the future pain you're anticipating? Well, one day we're gonna have a big blowout and then we're gonna get in a fight. Hey, I don't want you to work in Fit Body Boot Camp. He's gonna say, I don't want you to work in it. We're gonna be in court and I don't want it. So I'm anticipating court cases and lawyer fees mm -hmm. and all this stuff, right? And Fit Body Bootcamp just crumbling <coughs> around me. He goes, well, will that happen? I go, it probably will. He goes, but what if you did something about it? I go, shit, what do you know? So as it turns out, the only reason we have anxiety is because we're anticipating future pain because we're not doing anything about it now. As Soon as you take control back into your hands, he says, and do something about it. So I immediately went and had a conversation with the guy. We parted ways as friends. I bought him out. And everything I was anticipating never happened. Wow. Started doing that in every aspect of my life that was mm. giving me anxiety. All of a sudden, this anxiety-prone freak went to no anxiety in his life. But I'm a man of action now, which I wasn't then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are, there, are there things that you have now learned to put in place as uh, to watch out for these triggers or to if they do something does trigger you to like stop and okay, breathe, box breathe or meditate? Are there any practices that you've now included in your life to try to mitigate that? <laughs> yeah, one of the biggest things, and I have to credit Craig Ballantyne for this, um, before he ever wrote his book, The Perfect Day Formula, because we've been friends and business partners for almost a decade, uh, I learned The Perfect Day Formula through him, but unfortunately I learned it too late once I needed it. And I was like, Craig, he's like, remember we, you'd laugh at me? Because he'd want to have dinner at 6 p.m. I'm like, you're fucking nuts. That's like a late lunch for me. <laughs> you know, we're, we're having dinner like at 10, dude. We're in Vegas, right. we're in Miami, right? Running, a running ARP our kind of schedule. Right, yeah. exactly. <laughs> And uh, so I've learned to create my morning rituals the night before. So I write down my list of things to do, my hardest thing that I'm gonna do, top of the list. I go to sleep at the same time, seven days a week, wake up at the same time. Um, I, I've got 96 people that I've blocked on my, on my, on my phone, uh, people who just send me long text messages of the sky's always falling. Some of them are clients. Some of them are people just from my past who I don't want in my life anymore but I've created filters and boundaries. That's and, so important. Yeah, morning rituals. And those are the things, the dominoes, that if they fall, like if I get a text from that one person, it's likely to pull, put me in a tailspin, right? And so I've had tough conversations with friends, like, hey man, our paths are different now and I'm just gonna take a little break from you for now. 
And you got to have these talks. I became a better leader, led myself first into better health again, mm. and then lead my team. The best compliment you gave me was like, man, your team is so communicative. Well, great. That's They weren't before. Now they are. Mm. Like you show up in our lobby and all 42 people walk by you. They're like, hey, how are you? Do you need the Wi-Fi code? Has, does someone know you're waiting for them? You know, Do you need anything? Can I get you water, coffee, whatever? And that never happened. So I became a great leader, turned my employees into a team, got clear on my vision, where are we taking Fit Body Bootcamp, clear on the path, and I had the blinders on like a racehorse. And like I told you guys earlier, I just dismantled any other business that didn't have to do with Fit Body Bootcamp or me coaching personal trainers and growing their businesses, because that's my purpose. Now, or, order is, uh, is so important for managing stress, because I think it's that chaotic nature of the unknown that tends to stress the hell out of people. Yeah. Do you teach this with your coaching? Do you teach your the do. people who coach to have that structure to know what's going on? I do. Personal structure and discipline are the number one things. People come to me because they have a marketing problem. No, you don't. You're undisciplined. Mm. We can give you the best funnels and you'll get 50, 60, 100 clients a month for the next three or four months, but you'll do things to not create systems. You're undisciplined with the way you communicate with your staff and so you have an adversarial relationship or a passive aggressive relationship with your coaches and trainers so they don't deliver the service. Those clients leave. Now you're having more anxiety attack. Now you want the next marketing funnel from me. So I sell the marketing funnel, but I give them personal structure, discipline, and systems, which is what we all need. What, what does this look mm -hmm. like for you? Because I know you've done this probably for thousands of coaches and trainers. <clears throat> when you first go in and you're and you're helping somebody out, what are, are there, are there, just like when I help a client, I feel like there's common things I look for, probably over consuming sugar, probably stress, probably not sleeping. And what are your things that like, you know, right away to kind of look at, if you were to meet me as a trainer 10 years ago, and, and I'm coming to you saying like, man, Pedro, I just can't scale this business past 60, 70 grand a year. I'm fucking struggling. What are you asking and looking at? To the very first question is, all right, man, so what are what are your income streams, right? And you might say, well, okay, well, so I do a small group personal training, and then I do a, I have a myofascial release little workouts that I do, and I do a boot camps, and I do I have eight one-on-one -on -one clients. Great, got it, you have four income streams. What's, what's the biggest income stream? Like there's usually an 80-20. Mm -hmm. There's an income stream where 80% is coming from, and the other 20% are taking up time and energy and effort. Mm. And you'll tell me whatever. Let's, let's say it's one-on-one -on -one training. Do you like it? Yes. If I paid for all your bills in life, would you do that for free? Yes. Great. We're going to cut everything else out and scale that. Mm. And so I'll figure out what the one thing is that they like, they're passionate about, that's they making well. them the most money. Mm -hmm. And we go all in on that. And then from there, we start reverse engineering. What are your best marketing systems? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Where did you get the most clients from last month? Uh, referrals. Great. What about Facebook? No. All right. Let's create a Facebook system. So we, I start reverse engineering by teaching them systems, a Facebook system, an mm. email marketing system. Do you see how these systems make your business predictable? Yeah. Hey, I'm curious, in your life, do you have any systems? What do you mean? What time do you wake up? What time do you sleep? Well, my wife, she gets home late and so we watch a show and then sometimes 11 o'clock, sometimes 8 p.m. Oh, you don't have systems. In life, systems are called discipline and structure. Mm -hmm. Can I help you there? So I help them get a win here in business, which is what they hired me for, right. which is also where the sky is falling and we need to get them out of this limbic state of, holy fuck, I need money. Why are you having this talk about discipline and structure? So we fix the money problem first, they stop being limbic, and I go, can I create systems in your life? Sure, before you know it, they're like amazing marketers and entrepreneurs. That's wow. excellent, mm -hmm. it, the the military discovered that a long time ago, that's why when, you, when you're in the military, it's like fold your shirt a particular way, make your bed a particular way, stand a certain way, wake up at a certain time, because they know that extreme discipline results yeah. in uh, yeah, execution. On the flip side, however, uh, too extreme discipline can sometimes stifle creativity because creativity literally comes from many times the unknown or it comes from just things that are different, not necessarily the same. How do you balance that with the people you're working with? How do you teach them to be super disciplined but also maintain create that type of creativity or do you find it actually increases their creativity? I don't know if it increases their creativity but I teach them to be curious. One thing that we're never taught in any of the certifications that are offered out there is to be curious, right? What if I can actually deliver one-on-one -on -one type results in a group environment of three? Don't, don't go to 30 yet, of three. Be curious. What if I can actually take a 60-minute workout and bring it down to 30 minutes? Let me challenge myself as a coach and a trainer. Can I deliver results in 30 minutes and then teach them to do their cardio or their interval training on their own? Maybe I can, and therefore I can make it more affordable and open up the market to myself, right? So we forget curiosity because in the fitness industry, probably like a lot of wellness and health industries were taught this is the way it's done. So I teach curiosity as the last and final 
piece to the puzzle where it's okay to be curious, man. And maybe it's not three, maybe it's 30 people. We have some of our top Fit Body Bootcamp owners who are running 80, 90 person boot camps, yeah. but they have three coaches on the floor. I didn't create Fit Body Bootcamp with three coaches on the floor. I created Fit Body Bootcamp with one coach, 20 clients. They decided they're gonna have three or four coaches, 80 clients, one of them is the ringleader, and then they put the other three coaches in the stations that are of highest risk. Mm. So you've got a trainer in that one station fixing form, right? And then the clients rotate. Wow, had I not taught our Fit Body Bootcamp owners to be curious, they wouldn't helped. They wouldn't have been able to help the model evolve, which mm. now we teach that to all of our franchisees. And so curiosity is a really important thing, not to just personal trainers, all entrepreneurs across the board. Absolutely. Can, when you yeah. first meet a trainer, do you feel pretty confident you can tell if this is someone who's gonna be successful or not? Within about an hour of communication, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What are you looking for? I'm looking for I'm looking for a fire in their belly and a chip on their shoulder. Mm. And if they come to me with the the cowardly lion mentality, the sky's always falling panicky, they can't string their words together well, uh, they're blaming everybody else. You know, the competition is too high, and, and I, have, I have one client in Las Vegas, the competition is too high because my competition is the guy that was your client six years ago, and he's got eight locations out there. Well, he's probably not gonna know who he is, but uh, <laughs> who gives a fuck, I'm brutally honest with things. It's like, dude, I helped him open eight, I can help you open 18. It, it doesn't matter, there's overweight people all throughout Las Vegas, there's right. more than anyone can handle. So if they're pointing the blame out, 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 they're likely not going to be a great entrepreneur. I call those crop dusters. If they're saying, I don't know how to market, I'm a horrible leader, I got certified as a trainer, I built the training side of my uh, business, but I don't know anything about the marketing, so I need help. The more responsibility they take, the more I realize I can help you mm -hmm. because you're coachable. You're gonna take feedback where the other guy is gonna take my feedback and look at it as criticism every time, right? So the fighter jet, is open to feedback. The crop duster is is views everything as as criticism. The crop duster blames everybody else. Right, the fighter jet, yeah, takes responsibility. And so, within an hour of asking a lot of questions of meeting them, I know their success rate. They're still going to do better than what they did, right? But you're not about to have nine locations, right? No matter what, you know you can help everybody. Yeah. But there's a percentage that yeah. you can see that in their their eyes or with how they communicate. They're yeah. Like, okay, this motherfucker. It's yeah. going to be a big deal. Now, when you see that, do you tend, I mean, being a smart business guy like yourself, <clears throat> do you tend to latch onto those people or do you tend to stay close to them because you see that? W which ones do you mean? So like you meet somebody yeah. and, and we've already name dropped some people before we got on that are mutual friends of ours that are very talented, yeah. smart, building seven, eight figure businesses. When you meet somebody like that, do you tend to, you know, attach yourself to them right away and keep and foster relationship? Yes. Okay. Yes. I do because they're gonna grow so quickly that they don't know what they don't know. Mm. And the next level of growth might be the tipping point that fucks things up for them. I'll give you a great example, Jason Phillips, and he doesn't mind me sharing the story, so I'll share it with you guys. Jason Phillips was a horrible coaching client. He was a crop duster through and through. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh. through and through. He would show up to one mastermind session with myself and Craig, and then he'd disappear and miss the other one. Then he'd start missing payments to the mastermind, so we'd have to kick him out of the mastermind. <laughs> I'm gonna talk um, shit to Jay today. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> it wasn't until, has he told you guys the Thanksgiving miracle story where he didn't have any money to buy coffee yeah. on Thanksgiving? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. After that, he reached out to me recently, uh, about maybe a year and a half ago, he reached out to me, hey, I'm ready for coaching from you. This time I want to do private coaching, your most expensive private coaching. And I just replied with, Jason, with all due respect, you couldn't afford the group coaching, the masterminds. I certainly don't want you as a private client and then we're gonna have to chase you down for money. It costs a lot of money, 50 Gs, you can't afford this. No thanks. No, 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 I'm different. You just have to get on the phone with me, you'll know I'm different. The guy had transformed from the crop duster to the fighter jet. Oh wow! Hmm. He had a tipping point in his life. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was that Thanksgiving coffee morning. Maybe it was the fact that he's marrying someone or got married to someone who has what, two or three kids and mm -hmm. right now he just had his daughter. Uh, but something had changed and I say he does and he just keeps making more money. Like he texted me as I was driving in and you're like, dude, I had the shortest month of the year because we're in February now. He goes, I made the most amount of money I've ever made. And it's because he takes action. He has adopted speed of implementation as his friend instead of fear and doubt as mm. his friend. Like he was just the fucking chicken little if there was ever one. Oh, wow. has, any, wow. has anybody else surprised you like that? Where you're like, uh, I don't know if you're gonna do so well and then. Yeah, Vince Del Monte. Mm. Ah, you, you guys know Vinny? We were just yeah, with we Vince just, last week. Yeah, okay, we just hung out with him. Vince Del Monte and, and, and he, he's, a, he's a private coaching client again. And uh, 
Yeah, you mean, listen, I'm going to be honest. I, you meet Vince and you're like, is there any light in the attic? Like the way he talks, <laughs> man, like, is right. It's like, Vinny, are you there? And Vinny's like a giant puppy. And I, what I love about Vinny, he's so innocent. Like the innocence that yeah, I lost. That's the thing that we see. Yeah. yeah, the innocence that I lost as a kid between the ages of four and six, which is why I'm so protective of children. And uh, I see that in Vinny. So I was a really big Vince Del Monte fan, but I'm like, is there any light in the attic? Like, does he understand what I'm saying here about upsells? Because one of the first things he said to me when I met him was, I'm doing Taguchi testing. I said, what is Taguchi testing? He goes, we're doing a split test with 12 different variables. Well, how are you gonna, uh, split test is A and B, not yeah. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, right? I was like, Finney, stop that shit. Whoever's taking your money and doing that, stop it. <laughs> Just because they named it Taguchi test. What the fuck, I've never even heard it since, right? <laughs> it's the Gooch test. Yeah. Yeah. But, but now, I don't know if you guys know this, Vince has, he wanted to start a mastermind. Great, within six months, he's got a mastermind of yeah. 50 members paying $1,500 a month. 50 members paying 50, 1500 yeah. a month. Do the math. He's fucking killing it. Yeah. Vince is the king of, hey, I'm not going to listen to my own voices, my the idea fairy that, that I carry with me because the idea fairy wants to take me down a rabbit hole. I'm going to listen to Craig and Bedros. Mm -hmm. And every time he does, he's successful. And this isn't me being cocky because I've got my own coaches that I listen to because yeah. they have outside eyes on my own life, yeah. right? And so when I listen and take action, I get rewarded. When I listen, don't take action or take the opposite action because I think I know better, I always get punished. Biggest mistake ever is thinking you know everything. That's Fucking a eight. massive mistake. Yep. It's uh it's your ego and it'll take down it's taken down empires, let alone yeah. you know, your you know, normal little weak ass or whatever. Yep. Um is anybody surprising the opposite where you thought, Oh, this guy's gonna kill it and then just Yeah, there's several of those who just come in like, Man, I'm gonna be your next and they drop Vince Del Monte, Jason Phillips, Ben Pakulski, I'm gonna be your next Matt Wilburn, Bryce Henson and Stephanie Flynn. Cause they know the winners in my groups, yeah. right? Because I talk about them. Um, and then they don't, and it's like, fuck man, the, you, you started off looking the part, smelling the part, but then I saw that you were late to the second day of mastermind and you showed up hungover cause we're in Las Vegas. Oh God. You know, and I had to talk with them and I said, Hey, wh what fucking happened to you? How come you're showing up at 11 o'clock when the mastermind starts at eight? Uh, well we went, you know, the mechanical bull there, uh, we went and rode the mechanical bull before you know it, we're having shots and. Well, who else is having shots? That guy whose eyes are closing, that guy and that guy? Yeah. You motherfuckers don't ever ride the bull again. You're not here to ride the fucking bull. And in one of my, because I have four masterminds, in that particular mastermind, we have the whole, because we record everything, we, we show all new members the don't ride the motherfucking bull video. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're not, you're not coming to Miami to go to Prime 112 and fucking uh, get, get drunk with Jay-Z. You're coming to Miami to fucking sit with me and learn. You're going to Vegas to sit with me and learn. On your own time, with your own money, you can go do ride the bull, but don't ever fucking ride the bull on my time. Oh, that's hilarious. And so, yeah, there are plenty of people. And, and I get intense about this because, man, that one trainer can impact hundreds of lives. And that's a fucking, that's, that's what I'm on this planet to do. And I'm running out of fucking time. I'm going to die one day, you know? Yeah. How, how angry does it make you to see wasted potential? It's. You take it, it personal. I, I really do take it personal because I've wasted so much time that I'm trying to make up time for it. When I see wasted potential, especially people paying me to give them the advice, but then they fucking go ride the bull effectively. I don't know, this rage builds up in me, man. And maybe, you know what? Maybe I'm not an evolved human. Maybe I need to be more caring, more compassionate. I don't know. And, I, and I'm very open maybe to that. Maybe you care too much. Or maybe I care too much. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, would, you, what would you say uh, the diff big differences between scaling a six, a seven, and an eight-figure business is? Because- it's So different every step of the way. The leader. The mm. leader. You can- And uh, Extreme Ownership. Have you guys read Extreme Ownership? No. Jocko Willings. Oh, okay. That's right? The Navy SEAL mm -hmm. uh, right. talk, talks about leadership. And he talks, so uh, in, in, in BUDS, basic underwater demolition training, they have boat crews and there was like seven boat crews. The boat crew that was in the last place had a, had a uh, great team, but a weak leader. And so they were in last place. They brought the boat crew from the first place team leader into the seventh place team and a great leader turned a weak team around. They were able to paddle faster in sync and start winning. They came all the way up to second place. Mm. When they brought that leader into the first place, a horrible leader took a great boat crew and made them mediocre, right? Leadership is everything. And so I always say you have to build your leadership muscles as you build your entrepreneurial muscles. John C. Maxwell talks about this. He's, it's the leadership ladder and that yes. a, a eight can never develop any more than a seven. 
If you're an eight leader, if you're a seven leader, you can never develop a, anything higher than a six. And if you're a 10, you can develop nines underneath you. That's such a clear word picture. I love that. Right? Yeah. yeah. So true. How important is mentorship and, and having coaches? You've already mentioned now you have coaches. Yeah. How important is that? I think it's extremely important. It's outside eyes. It's So I've got my therapist now that I see once a month because he really helped me get through the darkest times of my life. Now I see him once a month and just rap with him about my, my personal life, right? I need outside eyes from someone who can go, oh, hey, Bedros, have you thought about this path in life? Craig Ballantyne, where my personal structure and discipline is concerned. Ironically, I was his business coach when our relationship started. Now we're business partners and have a podcast together. And now I coach him in business again. He pays me and I pay him to coach me on my productivity, life management, et cetera. Joe Polish, I'm in his Genius Network group, and he's making all the right connections. Joe, connect me with who you think I need to be connected to, because I think I'm connected to everyone I know, I need to know, I'm not. Joe Polish is the ultimate connector, so I pay him to connect me because he knows what my path in life is. Uh, Joel Weldon, he's in the uh, Speaker Hall of Fame, old dude, teaches me how to speak and sell from the stage, how to storytell properly, right? English is a second language for me. I, I, I'm i an introvert. I get nervous. This is a better conversation for me. On a couch, mm -hmm. you know, four dudes hanging out. Put me in front of a thousand people. Like, I know that's my purpose in life, but I get fucking nervous. Mm -hmm. Joel is my speaking coach. And every time I speak, we film it, we send it to him, and he sends me pages of notes, and I take it as feedback. And those outside eyes in those four areas of my life have helped me so much. I've gone from a knuckle dragging animal to a somewhat of a knight in shining armor. That's cool. Man. What are some of the, the 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 key takeaways to learn how to speak in front of people? That's such a difficult. I don't know if it's as difficult as it is scary. More than anything, right? That's like a number one fear for most people. Did, yeah. What were some things that you that helped you with that? So one of the things was is uh, people don't remember what you said; they remember how they felt about you. Ah. Yeah. That's that was a very key take. Mm. Transfer of energy, man. Yes, mm -hmm. because I would get up on stage with my PowerPoint and just again vomit out facts, mm -hmm. right? Stats and facts and numbers and figures and do this and don't do that. Well. With, if my energy's off and if I'm nervous and it's a lot of facts, at the end of the day, people do want to laugh and get entertained, and right? So one thing that Joel Weldon taught me that also Frank Kern taught me was um, point, story, metaphor. So make your point, right? And share a life story about that point and then a metaphor. And when you do that, throughout your, if you have 10 talking points, point, story, metaphor, the Bible's written in stories. Mm -hmm. It's the number one selling book for a reason. Mm -hmm. We learn from stories. Now, and also when you're sharing a story from your own life on the 10 <clears throat> points that you're gonna talk about, people feel like, oh gee, I'm, I'm really connected with him right. better, right? So they, they feel different about you. So they go, hey, what did you learn from him? Ah, you know, I really don't remember what I learned so much as, he's such a good guy. You, you, mm -hmm. you, I bought his product. He's such a good guy. And that's really what you want because you want people to let down their wall and let you win. Because the way Joel describes it to me, there's a third bullet point for you, is everyone in the audience is listening to you with their arms crossed, leaning back with doubt. Who is this guy? What are you trying to sell me, right? Our job is to get them to bring the wall down and lean forward, uncross, so that they can be. You're watching their body language. Yes, yeah. And if I can do that through my stories, now the information that I share is gonna absorb instead of bounce off. Mm. Well, someone as, as connected as you are in fitness and being in fitness as long as you are, I, I value your opinion on the state of the, the current state of the fitness industry. Like, what do you see when you look at fitness now as a whole? Like, what, do you, what are the good things and the bad things that you see in it? Well, the bad things right now is, uh, what are we, 2018? Is this March 1st, I think? Yeah, no, March yeah. 1st, 2018 is that, listen, it's here's why it's bad. The economy is booming. The economy is great. The economy is great just like in 2000 and five and six and part of 2007, everybody was a real estate agent, right? And they got a house to sell you and they, they were selling homes for above value. Wow, I'm such a great real estate agent. The economy crashed, who stuck around? Only the best agents mm -hmm. who had been around through the shit, right? So right now, there's tons of competition, tons of competition because the economy's booming, people have money, they're buying fitness and personal training online and offline and group and one-on-one. -on -one. And so, yeah, for a personal trainer, for a small gym owner, it's pretty competitive. The good news is lots of people have money. So carve out your niche. So carve out your niche and define yourself. Like, what are you known for? And I'm a big fan of being known for one thing. Like, I do one thing and I do it better than anybody else. I do personal training, business coaching. I don't do Pilates or spin class or yoga instructors. Personal trainer gyms. Not 24-hour fitness and LA Fitness and Equinox. Personal trainers. 
And so I do one thing and I do better than anybody else. So find your niche. What else? The internet has brought about like what you guys do, right? All types of programming. You can reach clients worldwide. Holy shit. Like through Instagram and this podcast, you're gaining an audience. You're getting them to know, like, love and trust you. They're actually asking you, hey, do you guys have services that I could buy? In fact, we do. They're digital. Here they are. You could be sleeping and making money. It probably happens to you all, all, all the time. So trainers now can really take their knowledge, their single income stream of one-on-one -on -one personal training or boot camps and parlay it by making a Instagram page and a, and a YouTube channel and a, and a podcast and now have a second income stream because we can all have an audience no matter how big or small. So there's so many great things happening. So the drawbacks are, hey, it is competitive right now. It is competitive and it's because the economy is good. But the internet is there to create another income stream for you. Boutique gyms, right? Uh, our Fit Body Bootcamp boot camps taking off, growing quickly. Um, you look at CrossFits, you know, there are people who want to train pretty hardcore, you know, CrossFit's doing well. And now CrossFit itself is doing well. I know many CrossFit locations starting aren't. to fail. Yeah, they're starting to fail. And that's because CrossFit HQ and I think Glassman, God bless him. He's doing a great job growing the CrossFit brand. But I think he also has an obligation and a duty to the owners. Like when someone says, I'm a firefighter and I'm a cop and I'm going to team up with my friend and the three of us are going to own a CrossFit. It's like, you can't have three jobs and fund a CrossFit. Your CrossFit has to fund your lifestyle. Right. Could you imagine if I sell a Fit Body Bootcamp franchise and I go, but you need another job to fund it? <laughs> yeah. Like, that doesn't happen. No. See, I teach business. He teaches CrossFit, right? right? You just take people to regional games and then global games or whatever the games aren't. Good for him. He built the brand, but he has an obligation to those people who signed the lease, bought the equipment and have families to feed, Right. Uh, I look at it that way. I have that fucking obligation. And so all of our franchise owners who own a Fit Body Boot Camp, I have to make sure they perform. They can choose not to. That's on them. Right. But I'm going to give them everything. I'm going to give them the rope, and I'm going to hope that they build a ladder and not hang themselves with it. Mm. Right. So, so often in the fitness industry do we see uh, companies grow and then disappear and yeah. grow like uh, Curves. I remember Curves. Yeah. Curves was came out of nowhere, exploded, fastest growing fitness franchise at the time in the history of fitness, and then just crashed. They had over 13,200 locations at, at their uh, peak. Number, at one number point, one. we yeah. saw CrossFit explode. You're starting to see it really start to level out now. A lot of people start to fall off a little bit. Orange Theory still on the upswing of explosion. Why do we see so many you know, ups and downs in, in fitness like this? You see it in every industry, believe it or not. Um, look, at, look at the sub industry, the sandwich industry. Quiznos came and went, right? Mm -hmm. Subway, for the first time ever, closed the most amount of stores in 2017. Uh, 973 stores they closed down in 2017. Wow. Mm. And Subway's been around for a long time. They have 26,000 stores. Jared really killed that, huh? <laughs> and believe it or not, and it wasn't Jared. It was the adversary relationship between the franchisee and the franchisor. Because mm -hmm. as Jersey Mike's is coming about, as Witch Witch is coming about, as uh, uh, all these you know, uh, firehouse subs is coming about, Subway chooses to hang on to the, we're the low price leader. And they're saying, well, we have higher quality, better quality, and mm -hmm. it's better for you. Mm -hmm. And Subway franchise owners are like, hey, we have to change our message. HQ is saying, no, no, I'm no, we listening. don't. Yeah. yeah, so Papa John's, it's it's on the downswing right now. So it happens in every industry where there's it's either a chain or a franchise, and it only happens when the guy up top isn't listening to the owners or the managers that are running. So why is Starbucks around since 1974? Because Howard Schultz still listens to all the partners that run the locations, right? They're not a franchise, they're a chain. The moment you stop listening and go, I know better because I'm, I'm on the top, you don't, man. The industry has changed. That's why I own my own Fit Body Bootcamp locations. I have my foot in the door. Smart. Your finger on the pulse. Mm -hmm. You have to because otherwise it's a massive ship and then you can't, how, yeah. do you, how do you know where to turn it if you're not listening to the people that are in the... Exactly, and a massive ship turns one degree at a time, so it's a small, slow turn. Right, so I want to know when the industry is changing as soon as I can. So I have trusted owners who reach out to me and know that I'm open to feed. Going back to feedback, mm -hmm. I'm open to feedback instead of feeling like they're criticizing me. Because mm -hmm. sometimes you, it can feel that way. You said something interesting about finding niche, and um, uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. In fitness, you're, you know, you've had the you've had the big box gyms now, which have kind of you know your 24 hour fitnesses, your LA fitnesses, your crunch, and at I don't know when it started happening, maybe early 2000s. It was a race to the bottom in terms of who could ch sell the cheapest memberships 
for the most access with the hopes that nobody will show up and use your jam. And right. that's the that's the general model. Good luck trying to compete with that, you know, on your own. And then you started to see these niche types of things like Pilates studios, yoga studios start to kind of, and I feel like that's, how important do you think that is? Like that finding that niche part for you, somebody. You ha- If you plan on not only surviving, but thriving, like making really good money so that you can pull yourself out of it and open up multiple locations and have a lifestyle, a really good lifestyle, you have to be in a niche market, period, period. And that, that's why when a Fit Body Bootcamp owner decides to add a juice bar, we, uh, we have a compliance department that cracks down on them. They had a squat squat rack. We cracked down. We're not CrossFit. We're not fucking 24-hour fitness. You don't need a juice bar. Mm-hmm. Don't add showers because you're going to have one shower because you can't afford to add five. Right. You're going to have 26 people upset at you while one person's showering, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, don't let the idea fairy come in. And so we go narrow and deep. We have a niche market. We do one thing. We do better than anybody else. And we continue to thrive. The moment you don't have a niche is when you decide that I'm going to serve everybody. I'm going to be everything to everybody and you're really nothing to no one. Do you have any businesses that you're watching in the fitness industry right now that really piques your interest? Business, yes, yes. I'm looking at all the influencers right now who are who have half a million to two, three million followers on Instagram specifically because Instagram has done something that Facebook and Snapchat didn't do, which was we all have a network now. I look at that as my own MSNBC, CBS network. And these influencers who have a massive following, yet they're hawking someone else's product for 10 to 20% commission. I go, what the fuck are they doing? Mm. Or they go, they get in the Me Too game and they go, oh, everyone's got a clothing line, I'm gonna create a t-shirt line as Mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. They're thinking too small with such a broad, it's almost like you have an atomic bomb, but you're treating it like you're at a fucking knife fight. Right. And I'm waiting for them to either explode in a good way or fall apart because they go, I'm, I'm just constantly putting up, because it is a full-time job, put, all the content they're putting up, mm-hmm. maintaining the page, growing the page, the DMs for 10 to 20%. So, so they're making what, eight, nine, ten thousand $10,000 a month, maybe 20 grand a month. With that many That's people connected yeah. them, it's, it's insane. They should be making millions. We dude. share that. We share yeah. this all the time on the show that we we get tons of different guests with all different size uh, social media followings. And more often than not, we will meet somebody who has two, three, four million people attached to them, barely making six figures. There you go. And mm-hmm. then we'll meet somebody who's got 30, 40,000 people attached to them, making eight, nine figures. Yeah. So it's crazy that, and I think it's, it's this problem that's being perpetuated by this young generation that's coming up that just kind of sees what this what this guy is who's got two million followers and everyone just starts to kind of copy of each other. And then you see all these supplement companies, t-shirt companies praying on all these yeah. all, all these athletes or famous, yeah. you know. Be a sponsored athlete. Right. We'll give you 10%. Yeah. To the yeah. point, Sucker. right. Free product. Whenever. To the point yeah. where that's, I remember meeting, and this was really, this is, uh, this is an epidemic in the, the bodybuilding game. So, yeah. and I, and I saw this, it was, just blew my mind. You've got these guys that become, you know, on the Olympia stage, like a Ben Pikulski, um, that has that much pull on social media because everyone's watching what they're doing and they're selling all these other t-shirts and supplements for everybody else. They have no idea. They've got a multi, multi-million dollar business sitting right in front of them, but they yeah. just don't have that. They don't think big enough. It's mm. You have an atom bomb. Like I said, you have an atom bomb, but you're trying to treat it like a knife fight. Like, what are you doing? Drop the fucking bomb. Right. Yeah. You know, let's just, but. If you can truly it, impact thousands of people, that's worth way more than just having a million followers. On social media. Very well said. And I, I, I don't have quantifi- quantifiable facts for what I'm about to share right now, but I can almost guarantee you, follower to dollar equation, Jason Phillips makes the most money followers to dollars. Mm-hmm. Like he has a multi, I'm not going to share his numbers, but he has a multiple seven figure business. And if I think his followers are under 15,000, mm-hmm. right? And, and And so when you really look at it, when you really look at it, those that are in the same nutrition coaching, fitness, wellness coaching business, they should have at least 10 times what he's doing if they have half a million or more followers. But they're, they're, they're under thinking, which is right. unfortunate. Mm. Yeah. Let's talk about you for a second. Like what, what are you, what's difficult for you right now? Like what, do you, what are your weaknesses? What are you working on? <laughs> Writing a book. <laughs> <laughs> Writing right. a book, yeah. But thank, thank God for Ryan Holiday. Uh, so as I was sharing with you guys, I've got a book coming out called Man Up, which is about entrepreneurial leadership in uh, September, late September. And uh, I I wrote what I thought was an amazing book, manuscript, 62,000 words, sent it to the publisher. And I didn't hear from them for like 
five weeks. So much so that I reached out to Lewis House and I go, hey, Lewis, when was the first time you heard back about the edits? He goes, oh, it should take like two or three weeks. I go, man, it's been five weeks. He goes, reach out to them. I reached out, they said, give us one more week, right? There's so much shit, we gotta clean up. Yeah, they, <laughs> they sent me six pages of notes of things to change and modify and edit and oh, wow. why is this here? And I realized I bit off more than I can chew because because I can scale businesses, doesn't mean that I can write a book and I couldn't. And so they go, here's six pages of notes, fix these and you have two and a half weeks to do it. And so as my friend Dean Graciosi says, if you have a problem that can be solved by writing a check, you don't have a problem. So I reached out to Ryan Holiday and I said, buddy, I know you you work off long time spans, but I got two and a half weeks. I'll send you $30,000 in cash in a brown paper bag if you can make this manuscript and these six pages of notes work. And he and his co-ghostwriter came back with just brilliance, brilliance. And so I've got a great book coming out that's ghost written by uh, Jimmy and Ryan Holiday. I forget Jimmy's last name right now, but um, I'm excited for it. But I'm, I'm a horrible author. And that's because I speak from the stage. I do YouTube videos and, and I write thousand word blog posts. Not totally different. Thousand word. Yeah. It's a, so it was very humbling. It's like when Michael Jordan went to play uh, baseball, right? Yeah. I'm sure it was a humbling mm. experience. So that's what I am not good at. So you thought, I'm going to do this good. Dude, I thought in six <laughs> or seven weeks I can knock it out. It, it was horrible. Yeah. It was embarrassing. <laughs> How are you balancing personal with business? Do you work a lot of hours doing all this stuff? No, no. Uh, like I told you guys, I have this 5% rule that I talk about. My, I only work in my zone of genius. My zone of genius is my 5%. Most people are doing things that are in their like 95%. Like they're cleaning their own house when they're, it's like you can afford a house cleaner, you know. They're doing their own shopping. You know, you can, people can shop for you now. Um, we forget because as we grow our income, we go, oh, well, I've always done my own dry cleaning, so I'm gonna take my own dry cleaning. You don't have to do that. So my 5% is delegate, motivate, sell. So I work six to eight hours a day, sometimes 10 hours a day on my 5%. So I get a lot done, mm. right? Whereas the other guy might be trying to do a whole bunch of stuff. And so they have to work 18 hour days like I used to, like I used to. So I've got pretty, it's not balance. It's more of a good work-life mix. Yeah. It's it's tough it's tough to narrow down that five percent. I mean, that one of the hardest things that uh, we've had to deal with with scaling this business is, you know, you work so hard to get it to a certain point, then it gets to a point where you're actually really moving along, and then what happens is everything looks awesome. Yeah. You know, everything looks like, oh my god, let's go over here. We can make a million dollars doing that. We can make a million dollars. Yeah, and we find ourselves scatterbrained instead of really becoming very myopic on what got us to this point and continue to excel at that. I think that's one of the most challenging things for people to do. Do you, do you have things that you, uh, to help people figure out what their 5% is? Yeah, I mainly tell people like, what is it that only you can do that no one else can do in your business? And so I always start off on a marker board with people and we'll draw the old Benjamin Franklin, okay. a line right down the center and we'll write 5% on one side of it and 95% on the other. So Benjamin Franklin said, you know, yes and no, right? When if he had more yeses and nos, then he would do the yes thing. So I just write 5% on one side, 95% on the other, and I have him do a brain dump. I go, all right, Sal, uh, what's in your 5%? Uh, should you be vacuuming this, this room right now? Uh, no, okay, that's in your 95%. And we'll dump, usually it's we dump out all the 95%. Should you be doing this? Should you be doing that? Should you be dusting the place? Should you be booking the guests? No, 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 no. Okay, so what's left? Uh, well, I should be interviewing them because no one else can interview right. like you guys can, right? Uh, what else? Uh, I should be, whatever else the thing is. I should mm -hmm. be programming. I should go find sponsors. Great, those are your 5%. So once you write it down and you see it, then I go, hey, you see this little line right down the middle between five and 95? Yeah. I go, it's like a cell membrane. It's porous. And I start kind of, scratching it out with my finger. I go, over time, that line wears out. And some of the, the 5% don't go into the 95, the 95 start pouring in. Mm -hmm. And what happens is people go, hey man, I'm gonna be late, can you vacuum for me? Before you know it, that, that becomes a habit. Hey man, I'm not gonna have time to set up the mics, can you set up the mics for me? Before you know it, now that becomes, I'll just set up the mics from now on. So you have to do an audit and go, am I still in my 5%? Holy fuck, I'm doing 22%. Start moving those other things over, go back to your 5%, life will be good. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I like uh, how about your 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 current fitness regime? You were talking about how you started <laughs> training a little bit differently now. Yeah, yeah. So I'm the king of injuries because <laughs> I just uh, I, again I you go too hard. What's going on, bro? I don't know what it is. I you know what? I think because I wasn't I, I blame my mom because I wasn't breastfed. I've got weak connective tissue. Sure. And, I, and I told and I told Ben Pokolsky and he's like I I doubt it. I'm like well Ben, <laughs> <laughs> you know we'll see. But so. I, you know, I've torn a bicep, ACL, meniscus, pec tear, hamstring tear, and pretty bad. I mean, like, like surgeries. Jesus, yeah. that's a that lot. parachute didn't open one time. No, exactly, <laughs> right? And these are all different occasions, ironically. And so I realized very quickly that I probably don't have the best training. I trained what I saw guys in the gym doing. Mm -hmm. 
And so I go, man, some of the like top elite athletes are my coaching clients now, like Steve Weatherford, right? Like Armageddon guy with the biggest arms. Like he's a coaching client. Hey, Steve, what do I do for arms? Hey, um, who the fuck did I just train with at Venice Beach? Michael Hearn, right? Mike, I've known you for a decade. We've never worked out. I'm going to come to Venice Beach. We're going to film it. You're going to put me through a shoulder workout because I got all the shoulder pain. He put me through an amazing shoulder workout where I felt strong. I was sore the next day in a good way, but I, I didn't have the pain that I normally do the, of the what feels like a pinched nerve in my trap. So, uh, you know, I'm doing this thing where I'm Ben Pokolsky in the April. I'm going out to Tampa for two days and we're going to crush legs and I think back. You're going to hit legs with Ben Pokolsky? I know. I'm going to die. Why? Yeah, you're I'm crazy. Yeah. You're crazy for <laughs> but, that. But basically my routine is now. So uh, um, two people have really helped me with my diet is uh, Freak Fitness, uh, Darren. I forget Darren's last name now. And then, of course, Jason Phillips. They've helped me dial in my diet, which now I can go anywhere and eat clean and have abs at the age of 43, which feels good. And then, of course, all my muscular friends that I've helped grow their business. Now I'm asking them, hey, I'm going to fly out to you or drive to you and you're going to put me through a great workout and teach me how to grow muscle without tearing it off the bone. And so it's scary as shit because they're big and scientific and smart. But I, I, I trust the process. And just like they trust their business in my hands, I trust my muscles in, in their hands. So mm. it's, it's been fun. Did you, this is so true with a lot of trainers, by the way, we tend to train our clients much better than we train ourselves. Very true. All with your injuries, were you looking back, were there signs leading up to it that you just ignored? Were you like disconnected from your body? Absolutely, absolutely. So when I tore my bicep, um, I had trained with an MMA coach that morning um, which is, a, you know, you, you have a lot of static contraction against your bicep, your, your arms when mm -hmm. you're getting people in an arm bar, you're putting in an sure. arm bar, whatever. And then I did back and bicep work that day with Josh Carter, a friend of mine who also works with me. And then as we're leaving the gym, there's these two ropes. And, uh, and I asked the gym owner, I'm like, hey man, what's the, what are the ropes for? He goes, oh, you, you climb the ropes and then you ring the bell up top and you climb back down. So obviously I had over fatigued that muscle and so I climb the rope. Ah, I could do it. Oh, I'm tired. So I just hang off my right arm just for a second to give my left arm a break. Ooh, snap. Pop. And I go down, right? Oosh. And Josh is like, holy fuck, you just tore your bicep. And he rolls up my sleeve and you see it rolled up like a Venetian blind. Um, so each time it was one of those. When I when I tore my hamstring, I was looking at someone in the mirror who was behind me. And it wasn't even a chick. So I was like, was it a chick? No, I was just watching some guy in a fluorescent shirt walking mm -hmm. in as I was doing alternating lunges. So I lost focus, Right. But again, I probably should have warmed up, done mobility and all that stuff, you know, focused, mm. um, been more aware of am I just overusing the bicep right now or the hamstring or whatever. So, but with all my clients, what do I do? You pay attention. Fo focus. And, <laughs> you know, we warm up, we do mobility. We, you know, we get them into the workout slowly. Everything that I would teach, I didn't do. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Why, do, why, do you, why do you think that is? Why do you think you're, you're, you weren't taking care of yourself like you should have or like you like somebody else? I don't know, dude. I honestly believe that there's some sense of like, I do, I enjoy hurting myself. Mm. Not, not, not like in the, I'm going to go tear a bicep. Today. No, you've survived as being the underdog, dude. Yeah. I you like my, being the underdog. I you put myself in an underdog position often. Right. You probably okay. self-sabotage and don't even realize yeah. that you do it every once in a while because you like to overcome. Yeah. Yeah. I, I literally was learning MMA fighting from this guy for <clears throat> six weeks. Halfway through my wife and I, so three weeks point my wife and I take my kids to mm -hmm. to Maui we're flying back from Maui there's this guy who's raging out at the front of the plane we're kind of in the middle of the plane in business class and um, he this guy's raging out and hitting the guy in front of him over the head the flight attendants are trying to calm him down so the other group of flight attendants are walking down my aisle with two zip ties linked together and I'm like ma'am what's going on is everything okay and I'm thinking this is post 9-11 this is like a few years ago sure everyone's going to dogpile on this guy but I was like you know what Ma'am, what's going on? Is everything okay? Well, he's a flight risk. He's a danger to the flight. We have to zip time. We're like over the Pacific right now, dude. I'm like, holy fuck. I travel all the time. Like nothing happens. Now I got my wife and kids with me. I'm like, this is going to happen. And so she goes over there and she's trying to get the zip ties on him. She looks up at me because he starts freaking out like, help. And I'm thinking everyone's going to rush. No one rushed, but this me and this one other guy. And I just went over there, got the guy in a chokehold. And the whole time I realized like, I have no idea what I'm doing because it's just been three weeks that I'm doing MMA. But this guy's likely to kill me. But like, why am I putting myself in danger? And it wasn't to be a hero. In hindsight, I look back. Like, I I just do things to maybe hurt myself just a bit to be the underdog. Right. In this case, it worked out. I ended up choking the guy out and put the zip tie uh, on him, and then uh, LAPD took him away when we landed. Um, but but all this, I, I've come to a lot of realizations lately mm -hmm. that I do like to abuse myself.
Mm. Do you fear like ultimate success where that no longer exists, where there's no more of that? I, wait, are you asking, do I fear all, like, like, like massive okay. success? Yeah, like, okay, no. now I'm so successful that I don't have any of this. No, if, if I lost it all, it wouldn't matter because I've mm. been broken poor before. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's not that. I just, I, I, there's a high I get off doing things, taking pain, and a lot of pain, physical pain, emotional pain. Bro, when you're molested for fucking two years straight mm-hmm. by two older boys mm-hmm. and you have to mentally fucking go away while that's happening to you, you fucking know how to zone out. Right. Like I can mm-hmm. put anybody in a box and put them away for good for life, right? Mentally. And uh, that's not a fucking thing I want anyone else to experience in their life. But that's pain, scarring pain. Uh, and I'm not asking anyone to feel sorry for me. Like I've gone through that with the therapy. I'm, I'm fine. I'm good. Like that's one of my superpowers now, right? But where that pain no longer exists, maybe I'm just giving myself other pain. I'm not trying to tear muscle. It's just I do things thinking I'm a fucking superhero. I could I could do it. And if I get hurt in the process, oh, well, I survived that. I can survive anything. Mm-hmm. I, I accepted death in, in seconds, as I told you, like mm-hmm. in that fucking guest house. I wasn't trying to resuscitate myself or call 911 off my cell phone. I was like, all right, I'm going to die. I just don't want them to find me stiff and bloated. <laughs> had a good yeah. run. <laughs> yeah, had a good run at 37. Peace out. <laughs> and so, you know what? I'm human, man. That's, that's my thing. And hopefully uh, one day I'll figure that piece out too. But until then, and, um, and this is why I also serve people. The more people I serve, the less time I spend in the darkness. I was just going to ask mm. you, do you get a, a different rush from, you know, helping others become successful? Is it more fulfilling? Is it different? It is more fulfilling. It feels better. Yeah. Yeah. It's very different. Yeah. I love seeing others succeed. I love helping others. Yeah. The, the help that I never got, I love giving. Mm. And, and I've realized that. My therapist has helped me realize that. You. You also have mentioned several times uh, about, you know, not being the smartest guy or nutrition, physiology, biomechanics, like you admit that. How how long or if ever was that insecurity? I mean, you and you have a multi-million dollar business that you've built within fitness, but yet you right. don't you would openly admit I don't even know that much shit about the body. That's fucking unbelievably impressive and that's a huge insecurity that most people have a hard time overcoming. Or at least people in fitness. Right. Yeah. But it's completely detached from what I'm amazing at and I believe I'm world class at I'm tip of the spear razor's edge at which is scaling a business a fitness business and these days you give me a dental business chiropractic business I can ask you enough questions and learn about your business to see the opportunities that you missed for a decade and a half being in your business Mm -hmm. Um, so you know I'm not a great trainer never was but I understand how the personal training and fitness business works better than anybody else on the planet you can but Ryan uh, Alan Cosgrove right amazing coach and trainer Mm -hmm. He can train. In fact, I have him come speak at our Fit Body Bootcamp World Conference because he, he can teach them how to train. Right. Yet I help him in his business. Mm. Right. Same with Craig Ballantyne. Same with Jay Ferrugia. Like, and so I, I just I'm really good at one thing: at business development. And um, trainers are all. I, I always remember like one of the things managing gyms and having. I had salespeople work for me. I'd have trainers working for me, front desk staff, the whole thing. Trainers. It was almost. It was always a bit of a struggle or a challenge to get them to understand that they have to be good salespeople, they have to be good business people. I didn't have to do that to my salespeople, obviously, but all my trainers wanted to do is be better trainers, which is great. There's nothing wrong with that. Like be better at training their clients. But when it came time to teach them about how to grow their business, there was a lot of reluctance at first. And luckily I'm a good salesperson, so I could eventually close them on knowing that this is very important. But I always remember that being a struggle. It was always something I had to, it was a conversation I had to have yeah. with trainers. Why? Because like, like, like doctors, like dentists, we think that, well, because I have, I've put all this education behind my name, people should come to me because of that. Let's right. just show up. Yeah. The reality is you'll have a heart attack or a toothache and you'll go to a dentist, but we kind of walk around with 30, 40, 50, 200 pounds of extra weight. Um, so people don't feel like they have to go to a trainer. So as a trainer, you have to influence and attract your clients, where a doctor, dentist doesn't have to. Pain or a heart attack or a disease gets you in, you know? And, and the moment trainers decide to adopt that instead of fight that, mm. our industry will become better and we will ultimately beat our competitors. You know who our competitors are, by the way? It's not the fucking CrossFit or the Orange Theory or the Fit Body Boot Camp. It's, it's the McDonald's, the Taco Bell, the mm. Coca-Cola, the Snickers. Who's it's, gonna win? They understand marketing where we don't. So I still feel like I'm not doing my fucking job in this industry. Fuck, they're marketing better and they're putting better science behind it. Yeah. 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 Their yeah. science kicks ass too. Amazing. I mean, they're hijacking our palates and, and finding a way for us to be addicted to the foods. Like yeah. 
man, they're, I, we're getting the shit kicked out of us when you look at uh, the ratio of people that are actually getting in shape and getting healthy compared to how many people are. I mean, that's the thing that always saddens me is that here we are in 2018 and we're supposed to be smarter and better, uh, yet we're seeing more issues, more obesity, more autoimmune that's kind of shitty when you think about it. Yeah. It's, you know, w- when we know more today than we did 15, 20 years ago, but yet it's continuing to be on the rise. So we're really losing the battle when you think about Big it. Big time. Dude, Peter, Peter Diamantes talks about in his book, Abundance, that we have, things are more abundantly available to us. Like in our hand, in our pocket right now, we all have an oh. iPhone of some sort where we can Google answers to things, right? Yet we are more sick, we're more broke, we're more dependent on mood altering drugs than ever before. Yet we have so much abundance around us, which means that the other guys are winning. Right. And so people who look at marketing and selling as bad, 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 I don't wanna be a used car salesman, embrace selling and marketing because you're selling a solution that's saving people's lives. You have to, you have to be able to look, you, you could know the answer to somebody's problems, but if they don't know that it's the answer, if they don't buy into it, you, you might as well have no answer. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference. Right. So, you know, I used to, when I would tell, teach sales training, I would change it to effective communication only because sales has such a bad connotation that people think, oh, I don't want to learn sales. So I would teach people how to communicate effectively. And really all it, what, it, what it's all about and what I used to teach people was <clears throat> I, if I can take my feeling and understanding of what I know and just transfer it transfer, uh, into your brain, like put it into your mind so you feel what I feel, now I've done an effective job. Yeah. But it always has to start with integrity. And here's the other thing about fitness that you know we rail on all the time. There's so much information. It's a lot of conf- com- you know, conflicting information. And there's a lot of bad information out there. And there seems to be, and this is true for any industry, but we're in fitness, so that's the one we see the most of. There's a lot of charlatans. Mm-hmm. Like how do you, is, is that one of the most important things for you when, you, when the client comes and hires you that they have to have impeccable integrity. How do you talk about that with them? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I've turned away plenty of people who, hey, I'm starting a supplement company and the product does this. Does it? Show me. It blocks carbs. Show me. Cause, <laughs> yeah, because I may not know that it does. I may not know how to figure it out, but I show me the supplement. I'll send it to Ben. I'll send it to Jason. I'll send it to uh, Joel Marion, who started Biotrust Supplements. I'll send it to the people who I know because I'm so well connected. And I'll say, no, you can't be a client. You're full of shit because ultimately it's my reputation because in the past, I have brought on coaching clients who I knew lacked integrity, but I needed their money. Mm. I'm being very honest with you here, and I needed, wanted their money. I brought them on only for them to erode our industry, and I'll never do that again. Mm. I'll never do that again. How did that affect you negatively? What was it? Just affect your name, or did you just not feel good about it? Well, the way, once I figured out what they were doing and how they were just burning bridges left and right, and I parted ways with one of them, and uh, he went and created a blog, and started to slander me for 18 months on that blog, right? And that was not a good feeling. What's crazy is the reason I parted ways with him and I saw this coming is he would slander all these people in the in the community that he served, right? The mayor and the whatever. And and I was like, wow, well, you know, he's, he's a dick to them, but I'm sure he'll never bite my hand because I help him grow his business. I help him get to seven figures. Sooner or later, they're gonna turn around on you. Mm. And, and he did, mm. yeah. Wow, yeah. what do you see for the future of the fitness industry, like business-wise, where do you see the opportunities? Like I said, social media is gonna to continue to grow and as much as people think that it's just all about posting pictures for Aunt Millie to see while she's in Tallahassee, Florida, it's way more than yeah. that. You've got your own network. I, I tell people right now, if I could snap my fingers and get NBC, ABC, any of those affiliates to put you on their popular morning show, like how much would you pay me? Oh, I'd pay you 10 grand, 20 grand, 30 grand. Would you? Yeah, how come? Well, because I'd be on a national network and a big popular TV show. I go, but do you know if all the right people, the right audience is watching? No. I go, what if you can actually create your own network, be on it 24 hours and have the right audience? What if NBC let you do that? How the fuck would they let me do that? It's called Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, motherfucker. That's what that is. But Mm -hmm. people are still treating it like this place to go goof off on, whereas I'm building multi-million dollar industries. Like, we're building Strength Camp. You guys know Elliot Hulse? Mm-hmm. Yep. Strength Camp, he's one of my coaching clients now. It's gonna be the next Fit Body Boot Camp, but in his space. I helped build I Love Kickboxing with Michael Perella. Uh, he was a coaching client. We replicated the model there, and it's all social media driven. We, we didn't, we didn't, we're not getting leads from Entrepreneur and Inc. magazines anymore like franchises do. We're getting leads from Facebook by following the right people and attracting them into our business model. Mm-hmm. So more people need to start looking at these things as 
TV network channels and less as places to go goof off on or just to sell a supplement and get 10% commission what, on. What do you see? What do you, what are some of the tips that you give to people with? Cause I see a lot of mistakes in my opinion on, on Instagram. One of them, in my opinion, I'd like to hear if you agree or disagree is, you know, I, I view social, social media as a way for me to be able to connect to you and for you to kind of learn about who I am and my message, what I stand for. And I want to, I want to grow that with like-minded type of people. What I don't use it for is to market and sell my products. In fact, if you go through my personal Instagram, you don't see me pushing and sell, <coughs> selling that because I, I think it supports uh, the rest of the business that we have right now. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? And what are the, some of the mistakes that you see people making that are trying to build an Instagram following? The biggest mistake I see people making is they are not being them, their authentic mm-hmm. and transparent selves. They're being in the entrepreneurial world, they're trying to be Gary Vaynerchuk and Andy Frisilla. Mm. In the fitness world, they're trying to be Joey Swole or uh, 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 what the <laughs> fuck is her name? Paige Hathaway, mm-hmm. right? Both both wonderful human beings, but there's only one Joey Swole. There's only one Paige Hathaway. There's only one Jeremy Bodia. Be you, be yeah. you. And the moment that I decided to be me and not a Gary Vaynerchuk or Andy Frisilla or Ed Milette, is when my social media following started to grow, where I just started talking about, hey, I didn't take out a loan. I didn't have rich parents. I, I, I failed many times. Let me make a list of my failures instead of a list of my successes and wins. Let me show you every chink uh, uh, in my armor instead of showing you that my armor is impenetrable. Let me show you all the kryptonites that I have in my life that can weaken me. And the moment I started to do that, I was like, they're like, holy fuck, you're the real deal. Like you teach actionable stuff, not just focus on greatness and you will be great. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> focus on lead generation, convert those leads into paying clients, keep them for a long haul, ask for referrals, motherfucker. That's the real. I'll give you that kind of detail, right? right? right. And then I'll give you the how to's. Mm-hmm. That's much better than focus on greatness and you'll be great. Mm. What do you feel about some of the, I, I feel like there's a lot of this, especially now with Instagram and you name dropped a few of them. Uh, a lot of fluff around the, the motivation shit, man. It's just people just motivating, motivating, motivating. And I feel yeah. like motivation is yeah. so short. Wake up, be the best. You're awesome. Yeah. Hard grind. Like what? <laughs> we can't get motivated from Instagram or from others. Motivation is just within. Like I've got this anger and this rage and this fire in my belly and the chip on my shoulder. And I'm blessed to have that. And I will keep stoking that fire. I will tear more muscles to stoke that. You know what? I realized sitting here, maybe that's what I'm doing is I keep hurting myself and putting myself through challenges and adversities. I just keep stoking, fanning that fire. Thank you. You guys sure. just saved me a $185 session. <laughs> <with Kevin>. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's really what he, one day at the end of one of our sessions, by the way, he's like, Hey, uh, Bedros, cause he's a horrible salesman. Cause he's a fucking therapist uh, and, and people uh, I always want to draw what he looks like it's Einstein minus the eyebrows so my therapist Kevin God bless him if he listens to this he's got no eyebrows and the first four <laughs> sessions we're just trying to find the eyebrows <laughs> the human face needs eyebrows but uh, one day he's just being awkward and weird with him like so and he's handing me the receipt it's time to resign card. right yeah I go Kevin what's up uh, so my price is going up by $20. I go, $20 a month, a week, when? He goes, a session. Okay, great, fantastic. I go, Kevin, $40, $50, $100. Like, you're helping me, you're helping a lot of people. No, 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 the people can only afford $20. I'm like, what am I doing giving business advice to my therapist? I'm here, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm here to get the help. $20 it is, Kevin. Like, I gotta go now, right? Like, uh, time's, time's money. Yeah, but it took him like 20 minutes to poop that word out. Like, it's, the price is going up, you know? Um, I don't know what we were talking about. I don't know. You got me into that story. That was a great story. (laughs) You know what I'd like you to bring up because I think it'll create a very good discussion. You were uh, on, I think, on the flight over here listening to an episode that we just recently did, uh, where <laughs> we scared the shit out of some kid who probably wants to. Oh, yeah, we, we, we shit on someone's dream. dream. We shit on someone's yeah. dream, which yeah. that's the those are the people you typically. So there help. are ways to make money owning a gym. Yeah, well, let's let's yeah. first talk about what the question was. So somebody just recently, for those that don't know, asked us on one of our Q and As, uh, you know, what what was our advice for somebody who was just getting into the fitness industry and had dreams to own their own gym one day, and it, without getting into a long a long story about. It Sal, Justin, and I, you know, nicely shit on that dream. Yeah, you guys even went on to say like Bradley Martin has his own gym. He's got over a million followers, and I don't know if his gym's profitable. I don't know if his gym's profitable, and lots of followers don't mean that your gym's going to be profitable. Right. Trust me, I know that for a fact because I've got clients who go, "I got two million followers, and I'm broke," as we talked about earlier. Right. What do you have? A gym, a supplement mm-hmm. line? It doesn't matter. It's, it's always the leader. Um, but yeah, I guess some young, and it was at the 54 minute mark in case you guys want to go back yeah. and re-edit that. I'm not saying you should. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I, I'm well, just, no, I stand, I'm OCD, you know, so I I stand by what I say. This is why I want to have this discussion. Hey, yeah. Well, here, let me defend it for a second. Right. So I've talked to a lot of, uh, trainers and people in fitness who want to do something or start a business. And the first thing I do, cause I, cause I was the opposite before. Whenever someone would 
come into my gym and want to work for me, I found myself closing them on working for me on how great it is. And I and it didn't really work out that well because sometimes I get people who weren't that sure and then they come work for me and then I was like, uh, why did I close that person to work here? So then I started talking people out of it. And then the fucking really hardcore passionate people were the ones that stick around. Mm. And I'm wondering if that's where it comes from because <clears throat> now when I, <clears throat> excuse me, when I, when wow. I get that, I don't know, I got, I got some of my throat there. I think you almost died, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have my own anxiety attack. Yeah. Now when I when people talk to me like that, um, I do. I, I almost like talk them out of it. And then if they stick around, now we get to work. Yeah, what do you, what do you think about that? <clears throat> well, I mean, here, here's what I think. That, that young man who sent in that question and said, hey, I think I want to open on my personal training gym. I'm a personal trainer, et cetera. You, from where we all come from, remember, I came from the LA fitness world, right? right? Big box gyms, you're absolutely right. They're not there to serve. They're there to take your money and hope that you don't come in so that they can keep selling more memberships. Think about it. the big box gym that's in your town, whether it's 24 Hour Fitness, Equinox, LA Fitness, 10 years they've been there, they have 20,000 people. They should put a sign that says, we're full, can't come in. But 89% of gym members don't work out after 90 days, but right. yet keep paying their That's membership. That's the model. Right. That's the model. That's the model. Anyone who wants to start that model, don't do it. It's going to cost you millions, and it's going to take a lot of time to build it out, and you're probably not going to do, get money. On the flip side, well, should I do a boutique gym? Well, you can, but don't do the whole, let me buy a shit ton of equipment and go two, three $300,000 in debt. And I don't care if you're going to do your own boutique brand yourself, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or if it's going to be, let me invest into a uh, Orange Theory type thing or a Barry's Boot Camp. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of treadmills you have to buy at $8,000 a piece. Now you're talking a $453,000 on average build out for a Very true. for Orange Theory. Mm -hmm. Guess what? I'm not here to talk up Fit Body Boot Camp because you can start your own version of a Fit Body Boot Camp as long as you know how to market and sell and retain and ask for referrals. Those are the only four things you need. But you, you open up a 2,000 square foot place light industrial or commercial. Your rent is about 2200 to 2500 to maybe $3,000 a month. You buy $13,000 of equipment, battle ropes, kettlebells, plyo boxes, pull-up bars, bands. Um, you put carpet bonded foam on the floor from a gymnastic center, right? You buy that from Dolomar. So now you're 13, 14, maybe $15,000 in. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that you did a little fancy build out. So you put a pallet wall up. And so now all in, you're probably $60,000 into a nice 22 to 2,500 square foot gym that you can do group training in, functional workouts, deliver results. Sign people up at, at 147 to 197 a month, long 12 month programs that are, you know, auto re, auto, debit or reoccurring payments, EFT, electronic fund transfer, and be the best at one thing. Just do fat loss or just do bodybuilding or just do functional training. And if you do that and start using social media, as we talked about earlier, a platform to use it as a network and position yourself as a leader in your community, be the Jillian Michaels in your community. Everyone just thinks that I have to have a $400,000 build out. No, you're starting upside down, man. You, you should be able to just max out two credit cards and be a gym owner and then learn leadership you know, Maxwell Malt, uh, not Maxwell Malt, uh, John Maxwell, right? Uh, Jocko Willinks and his book with uh, Extreme Ownership. And maybe when my book comes out, maybe they'll buy a man up, I don't know. <laughs> but the point of this is it's leadership, it's marketing, it's building a good team, it's having being focused on one niche, spending a little bit of money now, and then using that money to build out a bigger, better gym in the future. I now, love how I'll, you I'll, weren't vague, by the way. I love how you were specific. Like, yeah. do this, buy this, buy that. It's gonna cost you this much money. You don't get yeah. that much you don't get that kind of advice normally. Normally, it's this really vague, you know, and it, they don't- Now, it's creating the turnkey sort of idea and yeah. model for, you know, somebody going into that, where I think the argument where we were presenting it was like, yeah, a, a franchise is going to have, you know, a more of a success rate in that direction because they've actually created the model for yeah, the formula. Yeah, the system. Right. Yep. Why well, do you think the fail the, rate's so high? The other thing that oh. I think, the other thing that I think that I challenge that, and I'm playing devil's advocate here, is that, you know, if you- I, and this is my experience, and again, I want you to speak up if you disagree, is that you know, at all times I was managing anywhere between 20 to 30 trainers that were on my staff. And if you worked for me at this big box gym that was spending $25 million a year in marketing and advertising, and you couldn't find your way to the top two or three trainers, thinking that you were going to go outside of a huge box like that and build your own, I've never seen it. I literally have not. When I do see them have success, they're always the ones that had a lot of success in a, in a place like that. And even some of those fail because you know that's a different monster having a company who's providing all that, all those leads. Right. You walk into fucking yeah. 24 or LA Fitness, there's a thousand people and on the, the marketing floor. Materials, Are you fucking kidding me? You yeah. walk out on the street 
and you're it's zero now. Now you got to find out how to get a thousand people in front of you every day wait, that you were used to. Wait, wait, wait. Is it zero or is it now fifty thousand people well, in the community? You're See, right. and this is like the shoe salesman that went to an mm -hmm. island where they were all uh, uh, what do you call it? They're all villagers, I guess, or whatever. Maybe they went to the uh, some uh, uninhabited place where there was. Well, it can't be uninhabited. An island where there's a whole bunch of tribal people. Mm -hmm. No <laughs> shoes, right? He calls up the company and goes, oh my God, these guys are villagers. They're tribal. They don't wear shoes. Send me back. So they send the other sales rep in. He goes, holy fuck, send all the shoes you have. These motherfuckers have no shoes. I'm going <laughs> to sell every motherfucker a shoe. So it's the mindset that you go into it with. So when I mm -hmm. was in the LA Fitness, I'm like, fuck, man, the LA Fitness only signed up 300 members this month. And I did the math at $400 per new member, because that's the math that we used mm -hmm. in, in LA Fitness. $400 per new member. Here's how much money I'm going to make. Fuck. That's not the commissions I want. These guys are neutering the amount of income I want to make. I'm going to go open up my own gym because now I live in a town of 53,000 people. I got 53,000 prospects. Well, I later realized those are 53,000 suspects, but what can I do to make them into prospects, mm. right? Lead generate, right? Boxes, um, lead generation boxes at the local pizza store and supplement store and ta taco shack, etc. Hey, if you want to lose weight and tell me how much fat, fat you want to lose, I'll give you a free week of personal training. You might win the drawing. So I'd start lead generating before there was email and social media and all that stuff. God, it's so funny. Lead boxes were such a right? key yeah, component. We've all done that in yeah, here, right? Yeah, they yeah, they yeah. were a key component of lead generation. I don't think anybody does those anymore. No, yeah. no. Well, now you're not fishing with lead boxes. You're fishing with, you know, click funnel ads. Yeah. And, and I mean, Dude, we're, we've got this one promotion in Fit Body Bootcamp called Drop Pounds Get Paid. It's a six week program for 300 bucks. And when you lose the 20 pounds, we give you your $300 back. Oh, wow. Or we'll double the $300 and apply it towards a 12 month program. So we get two to 300 people sign up on that program when, when we promote it for one of our Fit Body locations. And then about 50% stay. So, I mean, look at the big conversion oh, rate. Oh, that's huge. Yeah. But now can they retain? So that's the other mm -hmm. formula. Retention, results, mm -hmm. right? And then referrals, the three R's. Retention, results, referrals. And these are the things that trainers don't know, haven't learned, ACE, and ASM. Yeah, they don't no one's you. fucking taught us this stuff. So yeah. we go open up a gym, go into debt, and then have Will a that ever happen? I mean, are you open to that uh, with, with those various The moment they go, hey, we want to license your stuff... Yeah. and put it into our certifications, I will go, here you go, license it, mm. license it from me. I'm always open, but they always want to sell more level one, level two, functional yeah. this and yep. posterior chain why do you that. Think that. Why do you think there's such a high fail rate for gyms? You think it's because guys go in there opening a gym, like I like to work out, so I'm gonna open a gym and then that's it? I like to work out, I get give my clients in 24 hour fitness or LA fitness amazing results, therefore I'll be really good on my own. Oh, and by the way, and the big box gym is the bad guy. They forget, as much as I hated the big box gyms, those are the trenches, and I'm eternally grateful oh, totally. for oh, yeah. them giving me the sales training they gave me, putting the pressure on me like they did. But again, it's a reframe. They look at it as, they put so much pressure on me. I look at it as, thank God they put that pressure on me so that I could learn and ask what am I- Prepares you. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Going into battle without a rifle, what the fuck? Yeah. So they go into battle without a rifle, and they go, oh, what happened? Well, you don't, you don't know how to sell. You're a great trainer, but you don't know how to market. No one's taught you a niche what a niche is, and you certainly don't know how to deliver results. And, and that, by the way, results are not just fat loss. Results are come from confidence. See, most people think like trainers. Oh, you got to think like a coach. When you can become turned from a trainer to a coach, in other words, a trainer knows where the muscle origi originates and in, in inserts. A coach knows, man, you know what? Sal doesn't <coughs> look like he slept a lot, a lot today. How can I get maximum calorie burn and effort from him today and then get him to come in tomorrow for another workout? That's what a coach does. A coach knows how to cajole you into getting a better workout. A trainer just knows how to program a workout and hope that you follow it and mm -hmm. stick to it. So there's coaching. So results is showing them. Results is them coming in. Results is them sticking to the program, the confidence, the self-esteem, self-image. Results is getting referrals. No one teaches that stuff. And until a trainer is like almost broke and they do that Google search to find my YouTube videos or my blogs, that's the only way they find me. Right. Wow. That's I, need why them, I need them to find me in the certification like manuals. Right. Yeah. That's why I, th I was saying that I think that going through a big box gym is so invaluable for somebody who's just getting into the fitness industry for those reasons, because Agreed. there's just not a lot of resources and places that you're going to find. And even the ones that do sometimes still don't even make the connection. I, I don't know how many conversations I had with trainers on their way out the door and saying, Hey, Adam, thanks for the two years of training and teaching me how to be a great trainer. I'm going to go do this on my own. I'm be like, whoa, 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 pump your brakes. Let me see your plan. And, and I was always a guy like I wanted to see that. I wanted to see, I, I took a lot of pride in developing leaders. And so 
I, I was okay with him leaving, even though that was going to make my job challenging and I had to find another one. I like that. I like developing them, seeing them go off and succeed, but many times they wouldn't. And many times they wouldn't because they didn't realize what, what they were getting inside that facility. And I don't think there's a lot of people that talk about that. And I too remember being a trainer starting and thinking that the end goal was having my own gym, but running just one gym and, and even the ones that make it, right? You, you look, we talked about CrossFit. You know, it's a great model of a low entry level to get in and start doing it. And they pay, they charge EFT, you know, seventy five grand a year, fifty, you know, maybe a hundred if you're fucking really good at it and you're working six, seven days a week and you're in there grinding like crazy. And then maybe you get that model running seventy to hundred, and so you think I'm going to open a second one. Oh, there's a new motherfucking monster for you. Right. It's one thing to build your own little box that you're in and that you're a great. Well, gee, leader. if you don't have systems, man, you're screwed. That's it. Right. I look at systems like an acronym and systems to me stand for save yourself time, effort, and money. Hmm. And hmm. people forget to replicate themselves through other humans, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, how many times do you get that email? How much do you charge? And every time you retype that email, you know, there's some called canned response in Google, in Gmail. You've typed that email out once, save it in canned response, and now you can have staff deploy that instead of you having to retype it every time, mm -hmm. right? Same with how do you answer a phone? There's, what are the top 20 questions you get over the phone? write that down, record it, and teach it. And this is the stuff that, this is why franchises have a high success rate because we just systemize the fuck out of everything because the Federal Trade Commission makes us. Because mm -hmm. if we have a high failure rate, like Quiznos, which is why it's going out of business, they can't sell any more franchises, I would not be allowed to sell more franchises if I have a high failure rate. So Fit Body Boot Camps can't fail. We only have a 2% failure rate, un unlike the rest of the industry, which is a 80%. Only a 2% wow. fail? 2%. Yeah, How do we not cover that? Holy shit. Yeah. Wow. wow. Now, okay, so at one point you were 640 upside down, you said earlier. Yeah. And w I'm assuming that you didn't have a 2% fail rate at that time, or did you even at that time? We had a massive failure rate because we were teaching our owners, here, go do this, run this Facebook ad. Well, we don't know if they ran it. We don't know if Facebook stopped that ad and they didn't try again because they don't have the emotional <laughs> resilience we want them to have. So it went from go do it yourself to done for you. So now we have an in-house marketing campaigns that we run for them. We drive the leads to them. We teach them how to do the selling and coaching and marketing and retention and all that stuff. It's all as much done for you as possible. Now, if we can go there and train their clients for them, we would. Obviously we can't, mm -hmm. but we drive the leads for them, help them sign their lease, negotiate their lease, the build out, the equipment, everything. Wow. You have a coach, a business coach, step by step with you throughout the entire process. We have something called the RSG program, ready, get, set, go, when you become a franchisee so that you don't fuck it up and open up a 6,000 square foot location when you only need 2,500 square feet. And all those things help contribute to the success factor. Right. How, so what was, okay, you were at 640 in debt, your fail yeah. rate is much higher. What did that transition look like? I mean, how long did so it So the take? transition looked like this. It took us three years to start breaking even, right? So uh, in 2011, we were $640,000 in debt. I was a horrible leader, had a business partner who I didn't share a vision with. Uh, we had a very tense relationship. And I had five employees who at best, at best, I was lucky if they showed up on time. And I was really lucky if they clocked out at five o'clock and not 4.45. Um, and this is a reality, man. I was a horrible leader. So as my leadership changed around 2013, 14, the business began to change. As I parted ways with my business partner and as I started hiring team members and training them to become team members instead of employees, employees clock in, clock in a little late, clock out a little early, do the bare minimum to maintain employment. A team, they go, hey, that's our opponent. We're a unified team with one unified outcome, which is to win. So I have team members, right? So for example, if uh, after this I'm going to Arizona, but let's say with, with the family, but if I was going to Arizona to go film something, everything that Ed there captures here, right? I've got a videographer with me for those listening. Everything that he captures, he's gonna go and edit while the other videographer would meet me in the airport, and we've mm -hmm. done this before. Jonathan would meet me at the airport, then we'd fly out to actually St. Louis. Mm -hmm. We went to St. Louis. And he, so I've got a team members who don't give a fuck if it's a weekend. They don't like, they are as determined to have chips on their shoulders. I hire people who are underdogs now and I train them to become fighter jets and we give them a rope and we go build a ladder because if you don't, you're going to build a noose and hang yourself. Mm. And you can ask Ed right now or after this, like I have high performance coaching days for my team members, not just the stuff that I teach my coaching clients who pay me 50 G's. I teach them because I need them to become the tip of the spear in videography and operations and sales and marketing and compliance clients, right? And so we started creating these really badass systems 
and that allowed our success rate to go through the roof. And we started raising our price. Franchise price went from $5,000 buy-in fee to $25,000 buy-in fee. And by the way, the more people pay, the more they pay attention. And so we're getting better qualified owners on board Isn't that who are funny? serious. Yeah, you know that, right? Yeah. 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 It's a, I remember charging more as a personal trainer and getting clients that were more serious. Absolutely. I was like, man. what the hell's yeah. going on here? Yeah. Yeah. When, we, when we interviewed Ben Pakolsky, this was something I kind of dug in on him a little bit. <clears throat> and, you know, I picked up on it real quick because he had said some things real similar to you. And I know stuff that I challenge, was challenged with was when you're kind of the underdog guy and you've got this chip on your shoulder, a lot of your success has been on your own fight, your own, you've learned to be successful, me. I could get into a, I could go into any gym, I don't care if it, it took 20 trainers to run that facility, I'll hit the whole fucking goal by myself. Boom. And if you, fig, if you, and you either run with me or you get ran over, and so much of my success was that way. Now, when I started to have to scale and I had multiple businesses that I was running at one time and all these different employees and different goals and visions, I fucking was failing all over the place. Seems like I was just kind of plugging holes everywhere. And it really took me developing my leadership (laughs) skills. What would you say is the the single best advice for someone like that? And I'm assuming you're someone who went through a similar transition where you probably kicked fucking ass by yourself for so long. But then at one point, you got to learn to run 40 fucking employees. Right. What did that look like? And what is some of the best advice you've had? That looked scary because I just figured, gee, everybody else will be as motivated as I am. They know we have to sell for him. Yeah, I know. It's, you're laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. Right. I signed the- We all think yeah, that at first. Right, 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 right. I signed the front of the check. Of course, I'm going to be more motivated. They signed the back of the check. They're not as motivated, right? <laughs> That's just the reality. My name's on the lease. Their name is not on the lease. I have more to lose. They don't have as much mm-hmm. to lose. But I, it's, it's silly, and I never thought of that. I just figured, I'm going to pay you. You're going to work as hard as I do. That wasn't the exchange that was happening. We just instinctively look for how can I cut corners? It's just a human way. But as a leader, I later learned that I have to set expectations and then maintain those expectations. And then there has to be consequences if the expectations aren't met. Consequences can only happen if we're willing to openly communicate instead of have this passive aggressive relationship where you didn't do what I wanted or you showed up five minutes late instead of me actually giving you feedback on it, me being huffy and puffy with you. And therefore you're like, what the fuck is up with Pedros? He's obviously on edge. So fuck it. I'm going to work less effectively instead of more effectively. Right. So communication, become a better communicator, be more decisive. I make faster, better decisions these days Mm -hmm. because like anything else, decision making is a muscle and you can improve it. People go, how do I make those big decisions really well. Start with the little decisions. Like if you and your honey are going to go on a date night tonight, don't go, well, where do you want to eat? Where do you want to eat? Should we see a movie first or dinner first? Make a decision where, hey, honey, we're having sushi at eight o'clock and then we're going to go see the Expendables after this because I'm a Sylvester Stallone fan, okay? And if she has a problem with it, she'll tell you and then she goes, I don't want sushi. It gives me diarrhea. So I'm going to have steak or whatever, right? Um, I've got a twisted sense of humor. So yeah, <laughs> it would be the wife who would have the diarrhea, not you. Um, <laughs> so, but, but that's a small decision or you're in a group of friends. Hey guys, who's going to call the Lyft or the Uber? Fuck it. I'm going to call the Lyft and Uber. I'm going to call it. Do it. Someone do it. Make all the little decisions. Your subconscious mind doesn't know that you're making a little decision or a big decision. It just goes, he's a decisive motherfucker. So when big decisions come up, you're still making decisions fast. Am I gonna wear a hat today? Am I not gonna wear a hat? Make a decision, don't him and haw, take forever. Just make a decision. Tomorrow's another day, you can wear a different hat or no hat, right? But it's, so it's great communication skills. It's being open to give and take feedback. It's being decisive, having clarity of vision. I know I want 2,500 Fit Body Bootcamp locations by the year 2020 with less than 1,000 owners. That means each owner has to have two to three Fit Body Bootcamp mm. locations because I don't want to serve a lot of owners, which means I have to have a big bloated team, sure. right? right? I want a small team of 40 or 50 team members serving 1,000 owners who own 2,500 locations collectively. And I know the date that I want it by, and I know the path that we use that we, to get there, which is Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Those are my mar- marketing platforms. And so clarity of vision is very important. And finally, you have to develop a team For you to develop a team, you have to be a want-to leader, not a have-to leader. So I'll finish off with that. A want-to leader is someone that, for example, if I'm working for you guys, I want to make you happy. I want to please you. A have-to leader is, oh, fuck, if I don't vacuum, Sal's going to get upset and get mad at me, Mm -hmm. So right? I have to be in a place where I don't want to let you down instead of I fear you. So many people run with the iron fist, right? Because they're passive aggressive. They hold it in, hold it in, hold it in, and emotionally go off at an employee and the employee's now walking on eggshells. Do I have the Dr. Jekyll Sal or do I have the Mr. Hyde Sal, <laughs> right? So, so the, all those things matter, but you have to develop your leadership muscles. You can't just overnight, it's not a light switch, it's a dimmer switch. And it 
took me three and a half years to develop those muscles. That's how, awesome. How much are you enjoying uh, the podcast space? Man, I am really digging it. I was a little awkward at first. I spoke very fast when Craig and I did our first maybe dozen or so podcasts. Um, like anything else, I went right back to just blah, giving content. Yeah. I'm like, wait a minute. This is just like when I'm on stage. You know, it's let me take my time. I've got all the time in the world. We can edit out to whatever minutes we need it to be. And as soon as I got comfortable, went back to, you know, point story metaphor. It was awesome. But it was pretty nerve wracking, man. Like, oh, man, we're on camera. What's going to happen with this? I am enjoying it. The feedback that we're getting is cool. Um, you finding it there. I find it therapeutic as hell. It's one of the most therapeutic things I've ever mm -hmm. done. The one that Craig and I do is very like, we're going to talk about this one specific topic. So there is none of this stuff, mm -hmm. which is why the, the BK podcast that I'm going to do at the, at my gym that I'm opening up BK strength is going to be very much like what you guys are mm -hmm. doing here. We're going to work out together and we're going to film and rec audio record the whole workout. And then we're going to finish off in our lobby as we're eating a high protein meal like final thoughts. And it'll just be people who fascinate and interest me from high performance entrepreneurs to world-class athletes or uh, Navy SEAL friends that I have or whatever. Yeah. Have, mm -hmm. a, do you have a favorite podcast that you've done so far? Um, a favorite podcast that I've done so far. Yeah. Or a good interview question. Any good interviews yes. that you've done? Yeah. 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 The, the model health show Sean. because Sean just somehow he's a great listener. He doesn't wait to talk. And I've been, you know, I've been watching, right? Like, cause I'm trying to get into the pod cast space myself um he's a great listener he doesn't wait to talk the ones that i don't like so much lewis house great listener asks wonderful questions uh as my experience here with you guys amazing and i'm not just saying that honestly i would be very honest with you You guys it's it's four dudes bantering and you wait to uh you listen you don't just wait to talk um the ones that i dislike was when you're coming up with the point and then the host is like yeah 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 that's right and then they go off on a tangent and like else. why why did you ask me to better or, or shift gears to it yeah <laughs> or or they're always having a dick measuring contest with you on the <laughs> on the podcast or whatever it's like why are we on okay if you're better than me then why why are we here <laughs> yeah um so i've learned a lot i've learned a lot of what not to do and i've learned a lot of just how to chill like what you guys are doing here which is why i asked ed like hey remember the scene this is how i want the bk podcast to be like um, the one that I do with Craig, uh, you know, we're standing up, we're looking at the cameras, we're teaching for 18 minutes and mm. that's it, you mm -hmm. know? Totally different. different vibe. Totally different. Like <laughs> yeah. this vibe is something that I want to do for my own personal podcast. And I, I've learned a lot just watching you guys the, and listening to your podcast. Yeah, the best conversations are when everybody's, when everybody's relaxed um, and they feel like they could just open up. And the other thing that we learned, uh, Jordan Harbinger, highly recommend you listen to his podcast. Okay. He used to be the host of The Art of Charm. Now he has a Jordan Harbinger show. And he said something that was just recently we had him on and we sucked at interviewing for a long time. We were really good by ourselves. Mm -hmm. As soon as we brought someone else in on the show, it was like we lost our chemistry and it became like huh. it became like a job interview. Like, OK, question one, question two. It just wasn't good. And we slowly started getting better. And then Jordan said something that was fascinating. He said, you know, because I asked him, I said, God, sometimes I find it hard to ask the tough questions yeah, the because ones. I want to be. Yeah, because I want to be respectful. Like it's a guest. It's like they're in my house. Like I don't want to ask this this guy about, you know, you know, why he cheated on his wife or, you know, the drugs he's used or that kind of stuff because it feels disrespectful. And he says, you're not doing the show for him. You're doing the show for your audience. Mm. And then right away, I was like, click, like, a, like, a, like a light switch went off. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, if I have a question, I'm just going to ask it. Yeah. And if the person gets pissed off, well, we got a viral video. gorilla in the room. Right? Right. Right. Let's right. talk about it. Sal pisses right. off Pedro's, you know, and he walks out. <laughs> We're posting that shit. You know what I mean? On oh, my yeah. way out. Uh, one more <laughs> one more iced coffee, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that nitro? <laughs> is that nitro brood? <laughs> Absolutely. Anybody you have your eye on in the fitness industry that you're not working with that you see and, and you're thinking, oh, shit, this is, this is kind of interesting? Oh, good question. Um, you know, I, I really wish a lot, there's no one specific, the the fitness motivation influencers that have half a million or more followers are the ones that I have my eyes on mm. because I know that Lots I Lots of can, opportunity there. The opportunity, and I know I just need to peel back a few layers and boom, and teach them a few things. I teach them to think bigger, act bigger, get more disciplined and organized. I get it. It's also, again, I don't know how much money Simon Panda makes or, or, or any of those guys, right? So I'm not saying like, mm -hmm. but I look at what Simon's doing, you know, pushing eBooks and digital pro programs. Like, well, that's fantastic. Like, how do we think bigger? Scale, multiply, franchise, license, right? Let's go there. Mm -hmm. Let's go there. Um, let's just explore those things. Because again, it goes back to being curious, curiosity. Let's be curious about what are the things you have in your wheelhouse. But, and again, it takes, maybe they have a huge following, but if they're a dim bulb, I can't help them. Mm -hmm. So I don't know them because I just see them like everyone else does on Instagram. 
uh, but I'd like to get a whole room of them in front of me and then start asking a lot of questions and then saying, get out, get out, get out, get out. And then everyone who stays, let me work with you for three years and watch what happens. Is there a way you're, mm -hmm. you're targeting these guys right now? Or I'm not. I just wait for them to all to come to me. I don't okay. target anybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody. Yeah, anymore. you've made a name for yourself by yeah. now, like if you're not. Excellent. And you probably don't want somebody that you have to go chase nope. anyways. It's right. like, I want them to they're come. They're not ready come, mentally. Come right? yeah. 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 Like Pokalski, Del Monte, uh, Jason Phillips, all these guys send me so many great coaching clients because they talk me up to them. And that's how I want people to come to me um, versus like, hey, Bedros is trying to sell me his coaching program sure. and he's name dropping, but I don't know if I want to work with him. Sure. Again, if the resistance wall is up, I don't want to deal with mm -hmm. you. And I'm in a place in my life where I make a shit ton to. of money. I yeah. don't have to. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. It's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to lie. I, I had heard about you in the industry. Wasn't, you know, there's so many of these like hype, you know, motivational speaker type people. I knew nothing about you. So I, can, I thought maybe you were like one of them. Then we heard a lot of good things about you from mutual friends. And uh, I'm glad... You know, we had we had you on the show. Definitely a lot, way more substance than the, your those you know motivational you know kind of rah 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 type speakers. Like lots of substance. You get very specific. I really appreciate that in our space because I don't think a lot of people are doing that. So mm -hmm. thank you, it, man. That yeah. means a lot. Yeah. True. Yeah. Raw, raw truth, man. Absolutely. Yeah. And thanks for coming on the show, man. Thank yeah. you. It's been awesome. Appreciate, it. appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes Maps Anabolic, Maps Performance, and Maps Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.